Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. Uh, if you are watching this after the live stream, because this is live right now, uh, be sure to check the description so you can skip ahead to the main content. Uh, in the meantime, we'll be in the, the waiting room, so uh, we'll see you soon.
Hello friends! Happy New Year! Welcome to 2024 and uh, welcome to Coding Garden. Uh, today we are going to be working on a mono repo because I have a whole lot of tools <laughs> and things. Yeah, New Year, new bugs, exactly. But honestly, we're starting the new year off with good intentions because my, my goal is to create a single unified code base where I can share all the things that I've been copy pasting into all of my various projects. Um, and I can have uh, better uh, commit habits, better testing habits, all, all the things we wish to hope for in like a really good code base. We're starting the year off right with that. That's the plan anyways. Uh, but welcome in everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, the plan for today is to set up a mono repo. And uh, we'll start by talking about what a mono repo is and why you might want one and talk about all the options. Um, and I, I did all this research off stream because I didn't want to spend hours and hours trying to make decisions. I've already made a decision. We're going to use NX. There's, there's other options, but I settled on NX for various reasons, which I'll talk about. Uh, but I'll talk about what it is, why you would want one, and specifically why it's going to be solving some of the problems uh, that I have in, in all across my code bases. Um, for reference and for context, um, if you check out the Coding Garden Frequently Asked Questions repo, um, this has a bunch of frequently asked questions about me and my stream, but in this repo, there's this document called Overlays and Chat Manager, uh, and it just talks about and links to all of the various code bases that manage my stream. So I have a lot of things running. We have the uh, chat overlay that runs behind me. Um, we have the drop, this is, this is specifically the Christmas drop game, but we also have the seedling drop game. Uh, anytime there are like uh, subs or bits or raids, that's a custom overlay that I created as well. Um, and then like the overlay that you see on this screen is technically the same shared code base as the other one that we were looking at, but uh, it's running inside of a, um, uh, a browser source. So, and there's other various things too that, uh, oh yeah, I guess I have like a shout out bot technically running and uh, there's a bunch of stuff, but there's a lot of code duplication. One, one of the main things is, um, we talked about this last week, I think, is the emote parsing. So in my overlay, anytime you send an emote, I have to figure that out. Um, and especially if it's a better Twitch TV or a Franker Faces emote, like Sag. So Sag is a 7TV emote. You, you specifically need the 7TV extension or the Franker Faces extension with the 7TV add-on to even be able to see that emote. But my overlay uh, displays it. <laughs> uh, and so there's some code that does some parsing for emotes uh, in this repo here. Uh, lib parse emotes. Um, we're going to clean up the code today, too. But this lives here. 
but it also has also been copy pasted into like three other projects that only all also need to do emote parsing. So one of the things we're going to do today is put it in a mono repo so we can share that code across all of the other uh, projects. Yeah, so we're going to take some time. We're going to answer all these questions. What's a mono repo? Why do we need it? Um, and then we'll get to get to working with NX. That's the plan anyways. Uh, welcome in, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, I guess you can tell from the stream title as well. I'm trying a new thing. I'm calling it Maintenance Monday, um, where we, we work on stream things on, on Monday. Um, anyways, okay. Uh, let's say hi to everyone, and I'll, and then after that, I'll let you know how the the chat overlays and everything work because we've gotten a lot of newer people in that uh, may or may not have um, used or ha haven't been in the channel before and don't know how all the overlays and stuff work. But first of all, let's say hello. Uh, if you would like me to say hello to you, you can say hi, hello, hello, hey yo, cheers, greetings, hi us up, what's up, morning, afternoon, evening, howdy, good day, coding hiyo, vo hiyo. Uh, or boga hey. So any one of these things, I will say hello right back to you. Um, and I'll keep this up so people know what we're about to get into. Uh, but we're going to go back in time to 16 minutes ago when uh, Alka was the first to say hello. But let's take a, a quick stretch. <sighs> hello, Alka. Welcome in. Oh, what's up, Dermerka? And uh, Kay Srinivas, good to see you. What's up, Zelino and Gorav and Jasper and Def Not Tizzy and SMC May and Mark Boots and Walid and Katoli and Lemur. Finder the Ice Wing, how's it going? What's up, Nick, Nick Presler and Adam Tarak, who asks, uh, do I plan on having an introduction to component testing in view with VTest? Um, I haven't thought about doing anything like that recently. Um, Eventually, we're going to have a consolidated place where you can uh, suggest topics for me to do on stream. Right now, the best place for that is probably the Discord. Um, so in the Discord, we have a stream suggestions channel. Um, I'm not as active in it as I used to be, but we're slowly pick, picking up the pace and, and slowly doing more things on the channel. Uh, so if, if you join the Discord, there's this stream suggestions channel. You can just throw a note in there of something you'd like to see me do, and hopefully I'll eventually get to it. Um, and then especially on Fridays where, where we do uh, Try Day Friday, uh, if it's something I haven't used before, I might consider trying it out on a Friday. But yeah. And what's up, Amasil and A.B. Rumi? How's it going? What's up, Riley and Makui? Hey, hey. What's up, uh, Mark and Poli and Indrav and uh, Calvari and, and Eskfil and Harasuna and Buddy? Uh, uh, Real Francisco says, been watching for a long time, but first time catching live from Australia. Oh, nice. What time is it in Australia? Um, I think you're like 12 hours ahead of me. On the other side of the road, usually people in Australia can't tune in. It's very early. It's early in the morning. <laughs> That's awesome. I appreciate you. Thanks for, thanks for dropping in. Um, and, uh, what's up, Samik? Welcome in, everyone. Good to see you. And um, yeah, yeah, let's get into it. First of all, how does my overlay work? Because you might notice that some people have some cool stuffs uh, beside their name. Um, yeah, and, and uh, Happy New Year to you, Raytheon. If you check out my gear page, it has all, all the stuff that I use. So if you go over to the gear page, um, I have a whole setup. It talks about it here, but... Uh, specifically, my streaming computer is the one with the monitors, and I have two monitors going. Um, let me let me show you my uh, this view. Well, actually, we'll go here. This, this one here. So <laughs> this monitor right here is the curved monitor. That's the scepter monitor. And then I have a monitor over there. That is the ViewSonic monitor because I also have um, this scene. The mic might be broken on this scene. I'm not going to try to fix it right now. But if I go to this scene, yeah, well, even the camera's broken. But <laughs> on this scene, I'm closer to this screen, so I actually have two monitors to to be able to to check all that out. Um, but yeah, if you go to the gear page, these these two are the monitors that I'm using. Welcome in, Poan. Good to see you. Um, okay. If we look in the chat, let's see. Uh, Samik has their uh, team set to Vue.js. You can see every single message they send has the Vue logo on it. 
And uh, Alka has theirs all decked out. They have uh, the, is that the Houston flag? Yeah, the Houston, Texas flag. And then he also has the Adobe After, After Effects logo. Uh, Harasuna has the Brazil flag and the Twitch logo. Um, Eskpil has the Norway flag. And then, is that the Mandalorian? Yeah, it is. It's <laughs> the Mandalorian logo. Calvaria has the Turkey flag and the TypeScript logo. So first of all, you can set your flag. And like Georgia, uh, Georgi, Georgi Adolio has the Costa Rica flag. Um, and then I think I, do I have the Denver flag? Yeah, I have the Denver, Colorado flag on, on all of my messages. Um, oh, yeah. And then Mark Boots has the Netherlands flag. Very good. Very good. Are you, are you in the Netherlands, Mark Boots? Um. I feel like that wasn't mentioned because I was I was in Amsterdam this past summer. Regardless, uh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. If you want to set your flag, you can do exclamation mark flag, um, and then followed by yeah, it, it gets complicated. We'll start with your two character country code. So uh, it has to be uh, the ISO standard country code. For me, I live in the USA, so my two character country code would be US. If I do that. All of my messages will have the U.S. flag on them. Um, but we have more. Uh, in, for instance, all we have all 50 of the U.S. states. So if you do U.S. slash the two-character code for the state you live in, specifically I live in Colorado, U.S. slash CO, now my flag gets set to the Colorado flag. And then some cities have also been added to our flag repo, which I'll show you in a second. So if you do flag, U.S., Colorado... Uh, Denver, which is where I'm in, that will give you uh, the, the Denver flag. Um, but if you check out our flags repo, you can see all of the possible things uh, over here. So this is a repo we forked from a repo that had a bunch of country flags in it and then uh, have uh, modified it slightly and then also made it open to contribution. So if there is a flag that you want to put next to your name that isn't in this repo, you can make a PR. Uh, but if you want to see what's available, go into the SVG folder. All of these top-level folders are countries that also at least have, like, states or provinces. Um, and then, so for instance, the U.S., if I go in there, then that has all of the U.S. states. And then each of these U.S. states, I think we have cities. Yeah, so this has, like, Atlanta, Georgia, for instance. Um, or San Juan, Puerto Rico, for instance. So uh, you, you just have to look in this repo to see if it's available. And then if it is available, you can do flag and then just follow the path. So like I mentioned earlier, mine was US, Colorado, Denver. Yours might be something different. Um, so yeah, look at that. Asime, you got the, uh, is that the Puerto Rico flag? Why can't I see the, oh no, it's Texas, Texas. I feel like it looks like the, <laughs> looks like the Puerto Rico flag. Uh, and then we have Serbia and Romania. What's up, Nick? Yeah, and then Nick has the Angular logo. Let me show you how to set the lo uh, the logos now. So um, if you take a look at the Font Awesome brand cheat sheet, yeah, it's Texas, it's Texas. Um, it has all of these different logos and brands, and you can pick one of these and put it next to your name. Um, you can also take a look at the, actually, I'll show you over here on YouTube too. I think we, um, we have the thing. It should be working, hopefully, yes. This is another thing that will eventually be part of the mono repo is I have a custom chat bot that works on YouTube um, and it will want to share some of the code uh, from some of the other repos as well. Um, but here's some links that you can click. The first one is the uh, Font Awesome brand cheat sheet. You could pick any name from here and then set that icon next to your name. And then there's also simple icons. Um, so if you look at simple icons, you, want, you can pick a brand or whatever and then pick the slug that you want. Um, but if you look at simpleicons.org, you can get like a, a visual representation of all those icons. Let me pick one. I will pick pick the logo that I want to rock. I mean, is NX on here? There's NGINX. Wow, NX is on here. We're trying NX today. So we're gonna I'm gonna put the NX logo next to my name. Um, and I would assume that the slug is just NX, but I want to make sure if I find it on here. Uh yeah. In X is the slug. And Happy New Year, Pablo. Welcome in. So if I say exclamation mark team in X, now all of my messages will have the in X logo on there. Look at that. Wow. Is that the right logo? It is. Nice. Um, and then you can also set the, col the color. So if you do team dash color with a six digit hex code, you can change the color. So you can see mine I set to green. 
Is that the Red Hat Fedora team? Got Java. Um, yeah, Red Hat. The Tux Linux Penguin. And of course, Pablo is on the Svelte team. <laughs> That's awesome. Heck yeah. It's, it's so cool to see uh, all, the, all the new people with their, their flags and everything's uh, getting set. So yeah, that's how you do the overlays. Um, it, uh, it lets you like cust customize yourself here in my chat. Uh, the other aspect of this mono repo we're going to be working on is eventually I want a lot of these, uh, these features to be merged into uh, like some kind of add-on that will... Yeah, so and that's what I'm getting at, SMC May, is only I can see them. But I could potentially create a custom uh, Franker Faces um, add-on like this. Um, and then it could make it so that anybody that enables like the Coding Garden add-on could see flags and badges and stuff like that. Uh, we've, we've, we've been talking about wanting to do this for a very long time, but hopefully, it, eventually we'll get there. And the mono repo that we're... <laughs> Potentially, um, but the mono repo we're setting up today is the first step, right? Like we're trying to consolidate everything. And so like once we get that, then there'll, there'll be some nice reusable code that we can then potentially use in um, the um, uh, in the add on and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so Pablo says any particular reason for NX over PNPM? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. So I, let, let's let's jump into that. Welcome in, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, let's, let's talk about what I'm using, why I'm using it, and then, and then we'll use it. We'll use it. Yeah, well, this is one thing. Um, oh, I have to sneeze. Uh, emotes do not work on YouTube yet. I need to add that feature to get the emotes working on YouTube. Um, but that code would be in the mono repo as well. Okay, uh, let's, let's start at the top. What is a mono repo? Um, you you might have heard the term, uh, but it's a, essentially uh, a single repository, in this case, a, a Git repository that has multiple projects or multiple packages or multiple apps inside of it. Um, you can check out Wikipedia. They talk about it. I'm going to read you their definition. Uh, inversion control system. So a version control system is something like Git. These, get, these days, Git is kind of the default, but there's other ones out there like subversion Team Foundation Server, if that still exists. I think these are just some things that I've used in my past, in the past in my career. Uh, but these days, Git is kind of like the main one. But uh, in uh, version control systems, a mono repo, repo is a software development strategy uh, in which the code for a number of projects is stored in the same repository. The practice dates back to at least the early 2000s when it was commonly called a shared code base. Google, Meta, Microsoft, Uber, Airbnb, and Twitter all employ very large mono repos with varying strategies to scale build systems. Um, this is actually fascinating to learn about uh, once you get into this. Um, the entire Google code base, like everything, everything at Google is in a single repo. And um, any anytime someone at Google, I, I guess, I mean, I, I don't know if this is still the case, but at least when I was learning about it, that was the case. And anytime someone wants to make a code change, it literally gets merged into the main repo that like basically manages and controls the all of the software of the entire company. Um, so that's a thing. But uh, this is not a monolithic app application. Um, I want to make that clear distinction because a lot of times when, hear, when people hear mono repo, they think of monolith. Um, and a monolith is just one really big application, um, and which is in contrast to um, a, uh, like a microservices architecture, I guess, sort of. There's probably other things too, but... Um, the idea of a monolith, like think of it as like one giant app that does everything. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, and specifically, like that'll start to become clear once I show you what we're going to do with it. We're not creating a monolith. We have a mono repo to manage multiple small packages and some multiple small apps. Um, but that's that's a good a, a good distinction to make um, is that this is not a monolith. It's a mono repo. Oracle also has a mono repo. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the the big companies do it as well. And what's up, BioDigital? Uh, happy New Year as well. Um, I have not seen that website, Gaurav. I'll check it out. Mono repo tools. What's it about? Um, is for example Rails, Django, and Laravel a monolith? It is possible 
to build a monolithic application with Rails or Django or Laravel or even Express, honestly. Um, it, you would really only call it a monolith if you just have one code base that contains everything, like all of your services, all basic, everything that manages the application. If it's in a single running application, that's a monolith. It's possible to not do that, even with Rails or Django or Laravel. I'm sure you could actually have like little one off microservices. So you have like multiple Rails apps or multiple Django apps or multiple Laravel apps that are all orchestrated to, to work together, but they're still separate. Um, that's possible as well. What's up, Chad? Welcome in. Um, everything you need to know about monorepos and the tools to build them. Wow. Oh, this is awesome. This is an entire learning how it all works website. Sweet. Yeah, thanks for that link. We're off. <laughs> uh, so did somebody show this to me before? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember everything that people showed to me. But yeah, this is definitely worth checking out, especially if it, it teaches you about all the stuffs. Um, okay, so that's what a monorepo is. Um, a single, uh, we'll say repo, in our case, a git repo, has multiple packages, apps, or libraries. Um, and um, let's talk about why, why, would, why we would need one. Uh, specifically, one of the main uses I'm going to have is uh, code sharing. Now, there's a lot of ways to share code, right? Uh, one way is to just push, like, publish something to NPM and then install it in some of your other projects that you might have. Um, that's a completely valid way of, of, of sharing code. Yeah, I'm using Alt-Tab. I am. Um, and uh, th that works. I mean, for, for basic purposes, that, that could probably work. And so if we look at the example right now of um, the, fa the, th the thing that I want to put in my monorepo is this emote parsing library or emote parsing functions. So uh, this is some code in my backend API. It's called parse emotes, and it handles all the work of uh, creating like a regular expression that can parse emotes that are from better Twitch TV, Franker faces, and 7TV. Uh, this is fairly useful code, and it's used in a lot of places. It's used in this overlay. Uh, it's used in the, the drop game. Um, and it's also used in my alert overlay, because like if someone does a resub or gives bits, but they have emotes in their message, I want to be able to display those emotes. So this code is used in like three different code bases. And and like like uh like well, there's no emote there, but idea, thank you for the prime. Um but uh right now it's a I have a very bad practice of just copy pasting this code into the different places that I want to use it. And that's not good because if I fix a bug in one place, then I have to fix the bug in multiple places. Um, so copy pasting is is never good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then uh, like like I mentioned, uh, this uh, overlay is technically the same code base as the other one, but it 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 uses the, the same emote parsing code. Um, so code sharing is one reason why we would have a mono repo. Essentially, we could have that emote parsing library as a package, and then any other other app that needs it can just link to it without having to install it all the way from npm or like without having to, to copy paste. So uh, like code sharing um, and code reuse is is one of the one of the main main things. Um, another th uh, uh, ask, uh, another thing you'll see with monorepos is sharing types. So in the JavaScript and TypeScript world, if you have a monorepo that has both your front end and your back end, some code is potentially reusable. Uh, things like maybe your Zod validators, um, anything that like doesn't have any like secret secrets in it that is essentially something that you might want to run on both the front end and the back end, you could create a, a package called types that has all of your validators and types that you want to share between your front end and your back end. Um, and so um, let's put that here, sharing types. This is one thing we're going to use as well. So all, all of our packages are going to be written using TypeScript, and we might have some types that describe responses that we get back from like the Twitch API or the YouTube API. And instead of having to copy paste those types everywhere, we can specify them in one spot and then import them into any of the packages that might that might need them. Um, yeah, so yeah, sh sharing types. And then also like uh, Pawan was mentioning is like you can create um, like uh, share utilities, like commonly used 
utility. So any functions that might be used in multiple of your packages, you can you can put inside that monorepo. <laughs> I'm never going to ship Zod to the client, but you can take a look at Valibot. I have heard of Valibot. Uh, let me catch up on the chat because there, there are some chats coming in. Uh, do the apps need to be in the same language? Um, I don't think they do. No, they don't. And actually, we'll see with Inex, when you look at their docs, you can actually create a sub package um, that is not... So uh, they're, they're, they are definitely like JavaScript and TypeScript focused, but um, they. I remember seeing in the docs there was a way to add like a .NET package to your monorepo. Um, yeah, index with your favorite tech. Look at this. You can add a .NET package. So, like, you could have a mono repo where you have, like, a front end built with, I don't know, Vue or Angular, and then you have another uh, back end repo written in .NET in that, in that same mono repo. Uh, so it's possible. Um, there, obviously, there's less uh, code sharing you can do because they're two separate languages, um, but you might have some, some reasons might, why you might want to put them in the same repo. We're going to postpone the, the break for a little bit. Um, but yeah, um, uh, Hassan Iyu is mentioning, uh, do I use alt tab? Yeah, if you, you can check out my, my full computer setup over on this repo. Um, and I talk about the productivity apps that I use. But alt tab is, is what I use to show the window previews whenever I'm switching between windows. I didn't explain how the overlay works. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do that today. But you, there's, a, there's a ton of past streams um, that, uh, where, I, where I talk about how it works. And then specifically, if you look in this repo, um, this uh, document talks about the various overlays and how they're running. I would say the, 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 one of the basic concepts here is the idea of a browser overlay for uh, various streaming software or a browser source. So I use it to stream, I use a software called OBS and built in, they have this thing called a browser source where you can literally put the URL to something and then it will actually overlay it for your stream. Um, and that's what I'm doing here. So like this drop game, it's literally just a web page, but it's an overlay for the stream. And then like this chat UI here, is a web page, but it's set as a browser source. So that's that's how all of all of those things are are set up. Yeah, and Pablo Pablo has a good succinct description. A monorepo allows you to have local package that multiple apps can use. Yeah, and you don't even have to publish it to npm. Exactly. I mean that that's why this is like very useful, especially like for large code bases at companies and internally, like you sometimes you don't want to publish something to NPM to be reusable, but you want it to be reusable within your own code base. Um, and this will let you do that. Um, I, however, am going to publish some of the packages that I have in that repo, like emote parsing is something that a lot of people want to do. So that one specific package I will publish to NPM in that, but it will live inside my mono repo. Um, there will be other things in my mono repo that I'm not going to publish to NPM because it's just for me and the tools that I use, but they can live in the same uh, mono repo. Uh, are there disadvantages of a mono repo? Probably. Um, yeah. It, it's it's more setup. There's more configuration. Um, sometimes your the things that you're doing don't necessarily like if they're in a nested folder versus being at the root. So you could run into issues there. There are, there are fixes when you come across stuff like that, but. Um, that's probably one of the main things is you're working with nested folders and like they kind of depend on each other to like live next to each other. So you could run into issues with that. What's up, uh, Strategy First? It has been a long time. Good to see you. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk about in a second what, what I'm using and why I'm using it. Um, and uh, Phyllis is asking also about NPM, PNPM workspaces. Uh, specifically with NX, it, it gets used in combination with NPM workspaces. So we're still technically using NPM workspaces, but Inex has a bunch of other built-in things which are really nice, like uh, project scaffolders. So I can literally one, run, run one command and it will automatically generate a Vue app as a package or a Node.js library as a package. Um, and it has all of the built-in things to make sure that like we're sharing our TypeScript config with those various packages. Um, and maybe we have like a build process that needs to be shared and, and it can it can help with that. Um, so NX is more than just a monorepo tool. 
Um, and ultimately, like we're kind of using the workspaces feature of NPM combined with NX to, to get, get the stuff that we want. Yeah. The plugins tab? You mean on NX? Oh, here. Ah, yeah, and then this lists all the possible things that you could add to your, your NX mono repo. So yeah, like like there's even like a you can make a go back in with like gin and, and stuff like that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Wikipedia page lists disadvantages. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm gonna get into that because honestly, I just want to start coding. But there, <laughs> I do want to um uh just talk about what this stuff is because I know a lot of people are new to it. Uh loss of version information. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, in our case, we don't, this this won't be the case. Um, we can um, have separately version, like each of our packages and, and apps can each have their own version. I think it makes, it makes it easier if they're all running on the same version, depending on your project, but it is possible to have them each as a separate version. Um, yeah, lack of per project access control. Like if someone gets access to this repo, they get access to everything in the repo. I'm not worried about that because everything I'm doing here is open source anyways. But if you're working at a company um, and maybe you have one code base that you only want to give access to certain people, if it's in the mono repo, you basically give them access to everything. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a lot more storage and more to clone because it's you have to clone the whole thing down. So that that's that's stuff to think about for sure. It is higher complexity. We're we're <laughs> we're we are going to spend a non-zero amount of time in configuration files, making sure everything works nicely together. But yeah, um, yeah, cr like working on a team and then like creating a branch where you're working on like one package, but someone else has a branch working on another one. It 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 definitely increases the complexity. Yeah, yeah, and in talking about package sharing, um, a mono repo is not the only way to share code or reuse code. Um, you could use NPM to install a package that's published to GitHub or any other Git source. So that's one way to share code. But for larger apps, it doesn't scale as well. It, it, it starts to break down um, once you need to have specific versions and once you need to install it in multiple places, it, 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 it's not as easy to just randomly publish something to NPM or randomly pull in a package for, that's posted on GitHub. Yeah, and again, it's not a silver bullet, but it is, it's going to work for what we need for sure. Yeah. Yeah, why do you need something like NX? We'll, we'll get into that. We're going to get into that because it's possible to not use any one of these tools. You could literally just have a single Git repo that has a bunch of projects in it. But one of the things that we want to be able to do is import code from one package into another one without any, without uh, having like a, a, uh, directory like it, it's because we're in uh, JavaScript and TypeScript if I wanted to import something that's that lives in like a directory above me I could just use a rel a relative file path like dot dot slash dot dot slash um, but uh, a better way to do that is if these packages know about each other's names then they can literally be listed as dependencies for each other so you're not like referencing via file path you're referencing by name um, so but yeah we'll, we'll show examples of that yeah, I was looking at I was looking at for NX. There's there's some plugins for NX that allow you that that uh, uh, allow you to do that. And um, this is another thing we're gonna we may not look at this today, but um, semantic release is a very interesting thing that we're gonna want to get working. But this is we're gonna let's just talk about mono repos for now. But semantic releases combined with conventional commits um, are really cool, <laughs> and eventually we want to get there. But today we're just setting up the mono repo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and faceless voice says, "How was your last stream with HTMX? What were your thoughts?" Uh, I think I think it was fine. I think if you are building an app and you prefer it to be server side rendered, you want to write less front end code. HTMX seems like a really good option. Um, or if you're already building a back end and you don't want to go through the process of setting up like a full fledged front end and you just need some basic interactivity on server rendered pages, pages, HTMX seems fine. It's a great solution for that. Uh, do I think every app should be built with HTMX? No, absolutely not. Uh, do I think every app should be built with like React or Vue? No, it's like there's a time and a place for everything. So if you're in that specific use case, then yeah, HTMX is going to be great. 
You could also do Git sub modules. Yeah, that's another option where um, you have like a single repo with Git sub modules. Each of those is actually their own separate repo. Yeah, and what's up, Harsh? Welcome in. Yeah, we don't want to do this. <laughs> this is what we're going to avoid doing. Um, we, we have multiple package JSON. So every project will have their own list of dependencies, um, but it is possible to share dependencies. Like um, if every single project is going to be using um, like the TypeScript package, for example, I do believe we can share that dependency from the root. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you don't necessarily need an extra tool. You could just, if you're already using NPM or Yarn or PNPM, they have a built-in way to do workspaces. I'll show you what we're using NX for. Yeah. I haven't looked at change sets. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, you you create a lot of open source stuff, right, Pablo? Um, and you would have experience with this. <laughs> yeah, but again, we'll look at that in a, in a future stream because I just want to get the mono repo set up today. Yeah. Or says, I'm working on an e-commerce site, but I'm confused about things I'm doing are right or not. How do I deal with it? First of all, do your best. Second of all, ask questions. I don't know if you're working on it with other people or somebody that's like more senior. Um, you should do your best to get the thing done. But then if you have questions about, well, did I do this right? Or uh, is there a better way to do it? Ask your, your superiors. If you don't have anybody that you're working with, you could post on Stack Overflow or find a Discord channel to ask people in. Um, Really, I guess my advice is just get validation somewhere. Like if you if you don't know if you're doing it best practices or something like that, you can you can always ask someone. Cool. All right, my break timer popped up, and we're ha we have an ad right now, so I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna pause. Hanser is great. My dog is doing great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a, a minute left on the ad break, so I'm gonna read you. Uh, a short story from so we started reading a short story uh last time um but it started off weird and long so i think i'm gonna skip it yeah let's read this short story so uh this one is called uh put your brains in your pocket by author H hop uh, born in honolulu and educated at harvard author hop has served on the staff of the san francisco chronicle since 1949 first as a reporter later as a columnist his Ast uh, astringent comments on every aspect of modern life have won him many devoted readers. He's the author of five books. Here we go. Uh, At last, the American ideal of true equality for one and all is in sight. Uh, the harbinger is that uh, latest rage, the pocket calculator. In Berkeley, for example, the Board of Education has approved buying pop pocket calculators for tots who have difficulty learning to multiply. This way, they won't have to learn to multiply. Yet they'll be able to go for go forth and multiply perfectly for the rest of their lives, or at least until their batteries go dead. The next step is obvious. A pocket computer with a miniaturized memory bank capable of storing billions of facts and the ability not only to multiply, but to analyze, deduce, and program solutions to every conceivable problem. Here's some context for this story. This was written, this book was published in 1977. Uh, <laughs> and then this story... Uh, I guess might have been published before that or around that time. So this is this is fascinating to hear the perspective of like, well, why don't we just give the kids calculators and then they don't have to learn to multiply? And then why don't we just give people uh, pocket computers that can just do everything for them? Okay. Um, and if you're coming back from the ad break, we're just reading a short story before we get back into coding. Uh, actually, just such a device was developed as long ago as 1938 by the famed electronics wizard, Dr. Wolfgang von uh, Howlin. Realizing the tremendous potential for human equality inherent in his invention, Dr. Von uh, Haulian decided to test it out first on his only son, Egbert. Egbert was an ideal subject. It was not that he lacked the intelligence to do well in his school down the block. It was that he lacked the intelligence to find his school down the block. But after weeks of patient instruction, his father was able to teach Egbert which buttons to push when. The change in him was startling. With billions of facts at his fingertips, he naturally quit school. And knowing everything, he naturally read nothing. And yet, unschooled and unread, he whizzed through life. His employers were amazed by his incredible knowledge and his cool deductions, his brilliant analysis, and his invariably perfect solutions. At 35, he became head of General Conglomerated Incorporated. I got my brains from my father, he would say modestly when complimented, and then he would hum a few bars of his favorite song, I've got, I've got a pocket full of brains. 
His wit and erudition made him a hit at cocktail parties. He always said the right thing. He did the right thing. He voted for the right candidate and never once forgot his mother's birthday. He was the perfect businessman, the perfect companion, the perfect citizen. And after he'd computed the proper steps to sweep the beautiful uh, Millicent Oleander off her feet, the perfect husband. While Millicent found Egbert singularly uncommunicative <laughs> in the shower or in bed, she was perfectly happy with, his per with this perfect spouse who never once forgot their anniversary. Needless to say, Egbert's father was overjoyed with the success of the experiment. Just think, he cried, when all people carry their brains in their pockets, all will be not only equal, but perfect. Dr. Van Halien was about to unveil this device for the perfection of mankind when the catastrophe struck. Afterward, he destroyed all his blueprints, muttering, Equality's nice, but maybe we ought to just struggle along with what we've got. What happened, of course, was that one morning while her husband was in the shower, Millicent sent his pants to the cleaners, and Egbert lost his mind. It's funny. <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny book. Okay, for context, this book was, was published in 1977, so it's a... It's a cautionary tale about having access to a, a computer in your pocket all the time. And I guess it ends with uh, he sent his pants to the cleaners and it destroyed the, the, the end. Yeah, that's the short story. And it destroyed the computer that was in his pocket. I don't know. I find it fascinating because now like that, that's a reality, right? We all have pockets in our computers, but it's interesting to hear like the cautionary tales that people were thinking about. Was it? 50 years ago at this point. All right, back to it. Um, we talked about what a monorepo is. We talked about why we need it. Um, who uses monorepos? Um, pockets in our computers? Yeah, we do. Look, look, look. We all have pockets in our computers. Uh, let me show you some, some, um, some uh, projects out there that are using monorepos. So, for instance, the... Did I say pocket in our computers? Well... Some people do. <laughs> we have computers in our pockets. <laughs> um, if you go to a Git repo and it has a folder called packages, it is very likely that that Git repo is a mono repo. And so Vue.js is a mono repo. If we look in their packages folder, th they have three different packages that make up the, the Vue ecosystem. They have the single file component compiler, the server render, and the template compiler. Those are all nested packages um, that are all published separately to NPM, but can be used by, by other projects. Uh, if you look at React over on GitHub, oh, isn't it like Facebook React? Yeah, Facebook React. Yeah, Angular is too, but if you look at React, this is, this is the actual source code for React. And if we look, it has a packages folder, and then inside of there, this has a bunch of separate packages. Um, so you have the actual React package, you have React DOM, uh, React Refresh. All, all of these various parts and pieces of React have been broken up into separate packages. For one, so that other projects could potentially use them. But also internally, you might say that like uh, React DOM is dependent on React, but also React DevTools is dependent on React. And um, they, they can now be in separate folders, but still like depend on each other. Um, yeah, and if you look at the Angular Angular JS code base, um, it too is a mono repo. It has a packages folder, and then inside of there, uh, we've got the CLI, the compiler, core. Each one of these folders is a separate package that all all makes up Angular. So uh, it's in a lot of places. It's and it's being and used used in a lot of places. Um, but yeah, I'll just put this all here, like React. Angular, Vue, they all use monorepos. All right, there's a lot of options for monorepos. Um, we're going to rush through this because we need to start coding. We've, we've already been live for almost an hour. Um, but built in, it, it, it wasn't always this way. Um, when I was working at a consultancy professionally, I actually used this tool called Lerna. Because at the time, NPM and I don't think Yarn supported any kind of like monorepo thing. So I was using Lerna. Uh, for a large code base that had like three Node.js packages, uh, two backend APIs. Um, I had a shared library where I, I shared all of my database models because that's that's another useful thing you might have if you have a, a bunch of apps. Like let's say you have two different backend apps that potentially need to talk to the same database. You can create a package that has all of your database models in it and then it can be shared by those two backends. Yeah. 
you you could run into cyclic dependencies. Yes, that is a possibility. Um, again, we're increasing the complexity of our code when we try to do something like this. So yeah, that's that's a possibility. Uh, but yeah, I use Lerna. But these days, it's just built into the package manager that you might might use. So if you look up npm workspaces, um, you can look in the npm docs. They literally talk about this thing called workspaces. It just comes built in with npm, um, and it allows you to have um, folders with nested projects inside of them. Um, and one of the main reasons you, you would want this feature is if a nested project needs to reference something else, it just references it by name. But when you run npm install, if it's set up for workspaces, it's smart enough to know that, oh, well, this package doesn't actually come from npm. This package just comes from the folder in the packages folder. And it figures all of that out whenever you do an npm install, as long as you've, you've set it up in the right way. And so we're actually going to be using this. Um, NX is going to set this up for us by default. But there are extra tools we're going to use from NX. And then both Yarn and npm all uh, can do a similar thing. And then Turbo, Turbo Repo is uh, from the people that created Next.js, Vercel. <laughs> this is a, is a Vercel, Vercel project. Um, and so this, this is also potentially an option. Um, and then one thing that I found in my research was that I hadn't heard about before was this thing called the rush stack. And this is actually from Microsoft. Um, and they have a really good breakdown on their website of like why you would even need something like this. And they actually do talk about, well, yeah, it increases complexity and, um, but at larger companies and in larger code bases, uh, this is something that you, would need and and you you basically you uh, take that trade off um, uh, more complexity for better code sharing code reuse and potentially setting up a repo to match match your like team and business processes like maybe you have a mono repo with various packages and each team is like working on a different package or a different app that's in that mono repo that kind of thing yeah okay but let's jump into NX. Um, now, uh, they call themselves a build system and build tooling. Oh, yeah, and then Basil, yeah. Um, yeah, Basil is another one to, to pull up. Uh, and Pinkush, thank you. Thank you for the gift. You're very kind. Um, this one seems like it was more so for native code, right? It says, uh, uh, Basil is a fast, correct, and scalable tool for building and testing Java, C++, Go, Android, iOS, and many other languages. Oh, maybe they support TypeScript or JavaScript, too. But yeah, this is another one, too. Um, there's a lot of options. You could get lost in the options. We're going to use NX, and I will specifically show you why just by running the command. Um, so uh, we are going to create a mono repo now using their, their, their command line tool. Um, I have to give it a name. I think I want to call it garden tools because this is the coding garden. The thing is, it won't just be tools. It'll be apps too. And Paikash, thank you. Thank you for the sub as well. You gifted and you subbed. That's awesome. Uh, do I have a repo called garden tools? I do. Developer util utilities toolkit. Um, apparently, I, this, I've already used this name. <laughs> We could just call it garden. We could just call it garden. And thank you, T. Reno. That's very kind of you to say. I appreciate that. Um, the shed. It has all of our tools, but it also has our apps in, in it too. Garden nursery. Yeah, let's let's spend two let's spend let's spend two hours just trying to figure out what we're gonna call it. I also I think I mean honestly I might just call it I'm gonna be generic with it and let's call it stream tools. Yeah, I don't have a repo called stream tools. Um, and then I could also like namespaces. So like on NPM, you can have things that are like namespace. So we could do stream tools slash emote parser. Right? So if somebody wants to use the emote parser that I build, um, Greenhouse is pretty good. Greenhouse is really good. Uh, the, other, the other name we have is uh, Sprout Kit. Which I don't think I'm going. I think I'm going to keep using that name, but SproutKit is going to get pulled into this mono repo because we'll have a package that is UI components like these these chat boxes. Uh, but then we'll have an app, which is the overlay that uses those UI components and uses that package. Um, so yeah, that's SproutKit. I really like Greenhouse. Is Greenhouse taken on uh, on npm? Maybe not. 
let's go with Greenhouse and just hope that nobody steals the name. And if you do, we'll just rename it. <laughs> I'm not too worried about it. Okay, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this command, create an index workspace, um, and I'm going to call it uh, Greenhouse. Green dash house or just greenhouse? <laughs> uh, what, is, what does it take for me to reserve a namespace on NPM? Let me do it. Here's the thing. If you reserve the namespace greenhouse, it'll have your NPM username on it and we'll know that you tried to uh, steal it from us. <laughs> I'm going to do greenhouse without the dash. Green. Our house is a home. A green home. <laughs> That's funny. Um, plane um i'm doing good i'm doing good where have i been um mostly just like busy with house stuff did someone just reserve the organization named greenhouse did somebody actually do it <laughs> um i don't the thing is i don't know what the difference is between like a namespace and an organization because i don't necessarily need an organization right how do i reserve a namespace I, yeah, I'm I'm live on on YouTube right now, so that this whole thing will be available on YouTube. It's there right now and and available immediately after afterwards as well. Um, is a namespace just a news username? Yeah, I guess technically it's. Um, um, it would have been an organization then. Yeah, so some, somebody did reserve it. I don't know how, when or it, how they did. <laughs> I think I'll just create an organization called Co Coding Garden, um, and we'll use the namespace at, uh, at Greenhouse. Green stuff. What's up, Killer? Yeah, that should be fine. I'm I'm not too worried. Like like I said, I'm not worried. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> so we're running this command. We just copied it from the NX web, uh, website, um, and now it's going to ask us what we want. So what stack do we want to use? This is one of the cool things about NX is it has project scaffolding. One of the one of the things I I spend so much time doing is just like creating base projects. Right. Uh, yeah, that's what we'll do, Mark, if especially if the greenhouse namespace gets taken. Um, but like, I mean, sometimes I want to create a view app or a Svelte app where I want to create a node library or an express backend or something like that. And they have these these project scaffolders uh, built in. So I'm going to start with none. So this is going to be create a base mono repo. And then once I have the base mono repo, I can start to add packages to it of various types. So I'm going to go with none. Um, and then they have a, a few options. So the uh, package-based is what we want, where um, um, e each each package can kind of like stand alone. It can be published separate separately. Um, there's something about integrated um, where it like shares. Honestly, like we we might want integrated, but it's from my reading, you can run into some issues with tools when you're trying to share dependencies. So it's kind of just easier if you just go with package based anyways. So we're going to go with package based. And then this question is basically asking you if you want to use uh, NX Cloud, uh, which I'm not going to worry about right now. We can always set that up later. Um, but essentially, that gives you like a CI server that can do automatic uh, publishing to NPM and, and various and automatic builds and stuff like that. So I'm going to say no to that for now. And this will give us a, 
just a blank folder with a package.json set up, and then we can start adding pack packages to it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we now have greenhouse, and if we open this up in... Uh, oh, it's been there for eight years? Fine, that's fine. That's fine. Um, we'll at least call it greenhouse in my GitHub repo, but then when we publish the packages, we can namespace them with at, at coding garden. Um, cool, but this is it. And as you can see, there's no code. Right now, it's all just configuration. Um, and if you look in our package.json, Inex has configured this for us to use NPM workspaces. So it's already saying, hey, all of my packages are going to exist um, in a folder called packages. And right now we only have two dependencies. We have the Inex tool, um, which is like a CLI tool that's going to have all of these uh, generators and commands that we can use. Um, and then let's see what else we got. So we have the Inex.json. Um, I'm not familiar with what this is yet. It looks like... It has like some settings that Inex uses. I think one of the other aspects of using a tool like Inex is uh, it does caching. So it does like build caching and then uh, possibly also like NPM install caching. So like if you have two separate um, packages that have similar dependencies, Inex is going to uh, make things faster when you're running installs and stuff like that. Um, it's telling us we should install that. Seems fine. All right, so we've got our, we've got our base our base mono repo. Let's add a package to it. The first thing we want is just a node library. We're going to create a package that uh, uh, does emote parsing, which we talked about earlier. Um, but this will just be a Node.js in in TypeScript package. It it's not an Express app. It's not a front end app. It's literally just JavaScript code that parses emotes, and that will just be a Node.js library. So for that. Um, we can go do the thing. Um, like, I forget where I found it. But there's something about just adding a library. Yeah, there's like these generators. And specifically, they have a node generator. Node library. Um... So, there, there, like I said, there's a bunch of generators. I specifically want to use this one because I want a Node.js library. Um, so, I'm going to copy this. And uh, I'm going to call it Emote Parser. So, I'm creating a library called Emote Parser. And then the directory it should be in is packages slash Emote Parser. Here we go. Ah. Uh, you can install NX globally, but I'm just going to do NPX, so it'll use NX that's installed uh, in my node modules in this folder. Here we go. Um, we will use vtest to test the emote parser, and um, then we can specify a build tool. I'm just going to use uh, TypeScript, so I'll specify TypeScript, and it's going to do all the stuff. Here's the thing. It's going to set up a default ESLint config, a default Prettier config. It's going to set up a, um, a TS config in the root that then gets uh, shared by that project. And then any other project I add will also extend from that base TS config. You'll, you'll see all the cool stuff it does. Um, but I'm going to start here. I want a package called Emote Parser, and it's going to be in the folder called Packages Emote Parser. Thanks, IPO. <laughs> I, I've been um, I've been talking about this for years. People's font sizes on Twitch are way too small. You bump it way up. People people want to be able to see your font if they're like watching on uh, on mobile or whatever else. Um, but check this out. It created a bunch of configs. Now you could you could be like, oh no, here we go. All these all these configs. <laughs> All these configs in my folder, but uh, what's nice is it, like it managed it like I didn't have to do anything. I ran the command. It gave us some nice sensible defaults, um, and then you can also see that it um, it created this packages folder, and then inside of that we have our emote parser package. But this too has a bunch of configs. Um, now um, 
this kind of is the state of things. Like each of these configs has a use, and ideally we don't have to touch it. I think I think that's the best case. Is like the config is just set up and ready to go. We can spend our time writing code and working on features and not worrying about the configs. But if we need to, they're still there. Um, we have like the ESLint ignore, uh, which ignores node modules. We have our base ESLint RC dot JSON. So this is all of our linting rules. Um, Preset up for us. We have our prettier RC ready to go. And then um, we also have a TS config. So we're going to be using TypeScript in all of our packages and, and apps. And this is a base config that will be used by each one. So we have the base config here that defines all the, the common things we want for every app. And then if we look at a specific package like emote parser, we can see that its TS config extends the base one. So any, any uh, settings we want across all of our packages and apps, we do that in the root, and then anything custom for this app, we'll, we'll do it in, in this file. Uh, same thing goes for the uh, ESLint config. So you can see that it extends the one in the root, but then we can add custom rules and settings in here that apply to just this, just this package. So uh, in, in my research, this is one of the main reasons why I picked NX, is it, it just does all of this for us. Um, and it kind of just sets it up ready to go. So typically when you're creating a library to be used like internally, but also like when you publish to NPM, you almost always want an entry point that exports all of the things that you create. Um, in this case, it just gives us a, a base function called emote parser that gets exported, uh, but we can update this with the actual code that we need. And we, it bootstrapped it with uh, VTest. So we already have tests uh, ready to go for, for, for the app. So yeah. Yeah, I was looking into Biome too. Um, but yeah, look, we're, we're ready to go. We can just start coding. I don't have to worry about any configs. I can literally just start coding. And uh, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, I'll definitely have to touch the configs. I know a lot, like, if you've watched, it, the, watched the listed streams that we have done here on stream, I've spent hours just configuring ESLint and TypeScript and everything else but yeah um but yeah it's it's good to mention biome because i have been looking into it but um i don't know if biome is ready just yet um but eventually hopefully biome will replace both prettier and eslint it's a it's a linter and formatter all in one um what did i run into with it yeah so i i tried using it in a project one of the issues was um well not issue uh, I like to make it so that my prettier errors show up as linter errors. Like, I want to see a red squiggly in my code base if the formatting is wrong. Um, and I couldn't figure out a way to do that with Biome. Like, if, the, if it's a formatter error, it doesn't show up as a linter error. But with if you're using prettier and ESLint, you can actually have a plugin that, that makes them work together so that formatting errors show up as linter, linting errors. That's the one thing I couldn't figure out. And then uh, right now, they really only support... Uh, TypeScript and like JSX, it, it's not it's not supported in Vue or Svelte or or HTML, anything that kind of like com combines the um, your JS code in like that's inside of a template. They don't they don't support that just yet. It's coming, but they don't support it yet. So um, I'll I'll eventually try to use Biome, but I don't think I don't think Biome is ready ready for me just yet. Oxlint, I haven't heard of that. Um, I don't understand something about NX. If we have two packages, the first package uses version 0 0.0.1, the second uses that, what goes in the node modules, how does it resolve that? Each package has their own separate node modules folder. I think, right? Maybe it doesn't do that with NPM workspaces. Let's, let's actually see this. So, uh, for emote parser, I am going to have a dependency on Axios. Like, do do we ax do we ax the Axios dependency now that we're gonna be porting and rewriting this? I really like Axios. Let's just install it to see what it does. But for instance, now now I'm ready to start working on my um, my emote parser. So I'm gonna go into this folder, and right now I'm just gonna pretend like this is the only project that I'm working on. I don't have to carry about I don't have to care about the root or anything else. Now I am working on emote parser, which is a uh, a specific package here. Um, emote parser will parse emotes. I'll, I'll show you, like the code already exists, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you here. Um, so if I install Axios as a dependency, um, it is going to update this package.json. 
in the nested uh, emote parser folder. You can see that it's dependent on Axios now. Um, and I'd be curious to see though if we if we do look at the the parent repo. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's NPM Workspaces that does this, but it actually installed Axios in uh, the node modules at the root. There isn't a nested node modules here. It's possible, like, I, I mean, we, I don't know if we'll get into, like, the details of it, but it's possible if two packages have a different numbered dependency, it might actually create the node modules in the folder so that it resolves that version instead of the other one. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, um, fetch isn't enough. Fetch, you, you have to really augment fetch to get it working the same way that Axios works. Um, so that's why I use Axios. But isn't there a, okay, let's, let's spend, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to, here's the thing, on this stream, we get bogged down with like, oh, should we use this or should we use that, et cetera. Um, I'm not. I'm not here to spend 20 minutes justifying my decision to to use Axios, uh, but if there is, I, I, I know of a. Um, uh, there, there's. I think it's called Redaxios. Redaxios is a fetch wrapper that uh, has the um, same API as Axios. However, when I use this, it did not have good types TypeScript support. Um. <laughs> it's 2024. Let's ignore chat suggestions and make big progress. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, for, for all the people that are like, just use fetch, I want to point you to why fetch isn't necessarily enough um, and uh, why I like to use Axios. <laughs> and I think, I think that's the other thing is like uh, these other packages that people recommend. So like there's Kai and then there's also like got... Um, throw them in the chat. What What is your preferred thing to use that isn't Fetch or Axios? Um, and I'll talk about why Axios is better. Honestly, let's let's just do that. Let's let's, let's spend a few moments talking about uh, why I still use Axios. Um, unjs o fetch. Just use curl. But what if you're in no? What if you're in? Um. What if you're in TypeScript, Node.js land? Rich? The heck is rich? You found something recently? So it's like, I want to use Redaxios, but the last time I tried to, I mean, and it was last updated two years ago, the last time I tried to, the TypeScript support was not the same as Axios. Um, like if, we're, if you're using TypeScript with Axios, you have things so you can specify like the error type that you're getting back um, and also like the, the actual type of the response and stuff like that. Okay. Ofetch looks all right, but here's one of my main complaints about a lot of these libraries that have come after Axios. Axios does automatic content type negoci negotiation. I don't know if, it, if, if we call it that when it's running on the front end, but if a response has a content type of application JSON, Axios is automatically going to parse it for us. We don't have to tell it to do anything. Um, if we're making a post request with JSON data, Axios is automatically going to add the content type header. We don't have to do that manually. Um, if we use fetch, we have to do both of those things manually. We also have, if we use plain old fetch, we also have to do error handling manually if it's not a successful status code. Um, if we look at how Kai works, um, again, you, you have to do this weird thing that says like, oh, well, it's JSON data. Like this, this is this is too much extra work. Like I just want to give it the object and the library should figure out, oh, hey, you're, you're sending some... Um, some JSON data here. Um, so like, <laughs> okay, honestly, here's, here, here's the, here's, here, here's the comparison.
Let me show you. Let me show you what the codes look like. Itty fetcher? Yeah, so that auto that auto parses the response. That's good. That automatically sets the content type. That's good. This looks cool. I, I this this looks cool. Does it have good TypeScript support? Hmm. Should, yeah, it looks it looks all right. But also, but also, let me just let me just show you because I, I honestly I need examples to point to because every this is live. Hello, Absar. Every time I bring up using Axios, everyone's like, just use fetch, just use fetch. And there's there's a reason that I that I don't just use fetch. Um, actually, okay. Kai is a pretty common example that that people mention to use. Um. <sighs> just use XML HTTP request. Um, this is how you would make this this request to to do something with Kai. Um, if we wanted to do the same thing with Axios, it's even simpler. Um, Axios .post. You don't have to do all that extra stuff, and we don't have to do dot JSON. So. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, so we called dot JSON that only gave us access to the response. Uh, the response object on Axios also gives us the headers, the actual data, everything else. Um, um, <laughs> just use fetch. Uh, so here, if we wanted to log the, the data, we would do response dot data. But you also have access to headers. Um, there's you can even get access to like the the raw unparsed response. So you have access to a bunch a bunch more stuff here. But the code is still technically simpler with with Axios. Um, okay, uh, let's show the example with Got because this is another one people recommend. I mean, it has seven point five million weekly downloads. Um, So got.post website name. And then again, they do this weird thing where you have to specify that it's JSON. Um, like this. Uh, got only works on the server. I thought it worked. I thought it was it could work on the client too. I don't know. But um so it looks fine, but again, I don't, I don't want I don't want this extra property right here. I also don't want to have to call the JSON method. That just seems like too much extra work. Um, and then unjs. How do we do a post like this? Yeah, it, it looks almost exactly the same as Kai, though it does have a data property on it. Kai didn't didn't mention that they have that. Um, Um, so this is, a, this is a little bit nicer, um, but it, uh, we still have to, we have to spe specify the method instead of it having like a dot post method on it, which I prefer. Um, and then... I guess if we want to parse it as JSON, we technically have to do this. And then error handling is the, the next thing I'll talk about because with fetch, that's where things start to break down. Um, oh, Kai and God are written by the same person. Well, which one is more relevant? This was published two months ago. This was published last month. <laughs> 
I guess is it that Kai works in the browser too? Uh and and then uh got doesn't that's hilarious. They're exactly the same package. Huh. Huh. Okay. Um now, how do we do the same thing with fetch? I, I think like technically, uh, all of these would be like wrapped in a in a try catch. Uh, um, and if the server responds with a non two hundred status code, um, it'll it'll throw it'll throw. Like this, same thing here. Well, I, I guess that I think that's the point that I'm getting at, Pablo. Is like, okay, you use fetch to avoid a dependency, but now you have a bunch of extra code. Let me let me show. I'll, I'll show you next what the extra code is going to be with with just fetch. Okay, so let's say we use fetch, which is just built in, and we want to make a post request. It's actually going to be very similar to ofetch. Um, We make the request here, we specify, I mean, it's, yeah, it's going to be exactly, almost exactly. Um, okay, you think, oh yeah, that's all I need. No, it's not all you need because you have to manually stringify the body. So json.stringify, great. No, and then that's not all you need either because you also need to specify the, the content type header. Is that everything? Mostly, but then with the response is where uh, things things get trickier. Okay, so um, let's say we throw this here. The only time this will throw if there's a network error. If the server responds with a non-200 status code, fetch does not throw an exception. Um, which means we have to do some manual checking here. So here we have to say, uh, if response.ok, great. Now we uh, parse, handle, etc. If response was not ok, then that means potentially if we want it to behave in the same way, then we want to throw some error. Um, but what error do we throw? Well, can we assume that the server responded with JSON? And just say something like the uh, error JSON is uh, response.json. And then maybe that has a message property on it. We'd have to figure out like the, the API that we're that we're talking to. Um, but uh, what uh, I guess the other scenario is well, if the response was okay here, then we also we we do want the JSON as well. Um, the here. Um, and this is also assuming we know that the server is going to respond with JSON. Um, because what's actually happening with, with Axios is there's another check right here that says um, we want to get access to the response headers and look at the content type of the response and then parse it ac accordingly. So we'll say something like uh, if response.headers um, dot get uh, content type, I think. Um, something like includes, so, um, did the server give us back a content type header that was application JSON? And if they did, okay, we'll parse it as JSON. Um, otherwise we want to check, well, uh, did they specify that it's just like text? Um, I think it's just be like application text or txt or something like that. And then if that's the case, we actually just want to parse it uh, using the built-in uh, text parser. Um, cool. And then you kind of need to duplicate this logic for your error handling as well. Like you can't just assume that your, your error response was JSON. You might do something like this, um, but then if it was text, we throw the text here. <laughs> No, but that's what I'm saying, Pablo. I don't want to maintain this code. But 
uh, I think I think I think this is I think this is probably enough um, to demonstrate my point. Um, uh, maybe we have result here, and then we parse the result. CJ fetch, yeah. I mean, I think technically I did. Here's the thing: I did a long time ago. I made an easy fetch, um, but I, I didn't. I didn't want to maintain it. Yeah, look, this is mine. Six years ago. <laughs> Six years ago, I made this, uh, but I, I didn't want to maintain it. So somehow, so for some reason, four people are downloading it a week. Um, okay, and then here we log the result if if it was okay, um, and then here we. Um, we, we throw the air. Okay. All of this code here is what we'd, we would need to do to get the same functionality as this code right here with Axios. And I don't want to do that. Um, oh, yeah. Well, so now th this, that, th but this is just now, right now, we're just talking about JSON responses. What if you have to deal with form data or uploads or other things like that? Then it gets even more complicated. Um, so this is why I don't just use fetch. Um, because I don't want to have to maintain this code. Now, I think like some people do, and I, and I think that's fine. Like you, like, here's the thing. We're, we're, we're actually creating a mono repo right now. Maybe I have a sub package called, uh, easy fetch. And that sub package has this code in it. And then I use it anywhere that I need fetch. Um, but, um, uh, Yes. Well, I, I think I think it does me, hi, Andre. That's the other thing we we uh, we have to we can get into is request retries. If this fails, what if I want to try requesting again uh, with fetch? That's going to be very manual. You would you basically in your try catch, you would then like recall the function or something like that. Uh, easier fetch. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure Axios has retries built in. Let's look. Maybe they have a plugin for it. Intercept failed requests. I guess that's the other thing about Axios is they have a whole like plugin ecosystem. But uh, to, to answer the person's um, question about like what do people have against Axios, it is it is another dependency. I think the the real discussion here. Oh, we have we're at, we have an ad. I'm gonna break. I'm breaking for ads. <clears throat> Does everyone get what I'm saying, though? <laughs> like, I think the I think the main the main thing is like you you might say okay I want to. Um, I will maintain this code because I just have to write it once and then I can use it in multiple places. But it, uh, oh, where did the five minute timer go? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Is it still going? Um, I think we'll do a next short, we'll do a short story at the next ad break. Um, did I just get rid of the timer? Maybe I did. Wait, is there a stream where Axios created problems for me? <laughs> um, okay, but yeah, so um, in, in terms of if people are new to all of this and like, well, why do people even hate Axios to begin with? Uh, it's it's another dependency. So like one of the one of the mentalities might be, well, I don't want one more dependency in my code base if I can just use something that's built in. And for some things, I agree with that. But for this. There's so much more than than the um, than the built-in thing. There's so much more that needs to happen than just the built-in thing can do, which is why I still reach for this as a dependency. Um, the other complaint about Axios is that it 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 uh, might be a little bit too big. It's like a if you especially if you're including it in front-end code, um, you can see. I mean, the unpack size is 1.8 megabytes, but if you deploy a website with Axios, you're not you're not getting it's not two megabytes of code. Um, it is, um, it's way smaller than that, but that's what all people are also worried about is, well, if you install Axios as a dependency, now you have a much larger front end bundle because you had to include Axios as a dependency. Um, so th there are trade-offs. Ultimately, I really like the, the, the way that Axios works. It's simple. 
It does all the extra stuff for me, um, which is why I'm going to keep using Axios. Now, there are potentially better solutions. I guess, like, Itty Fetcher looks pretty cool, though. Um, yeah, Bundle Phobia. That's the one. What's up, Josh? Joshua. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 11 kilobytes. Um, it's something to consider, though, right? Like, if you're building an app that people are loading on mobile phones only on data connections or in places with, like, slow internet, you are technically adding 200 milliseconds of load time. <laughs> so, I mean, but is 11 kilobytes actually a lot? The other thing is it's going to be cached anyways. Like, you do that download one time. The first time you load the app... And then it's cached every other time after that. And if you use it from a CD, and it might already be cached then as well. Right? I don't know. I think I'm done talking about it. And I think I've already, I've convinced myself that I will use Axios until something like Redaxios gets better TypeScript support. Um... Yeah, and then if it's, so tree shaking is the concept where it shakes away anything that isn't, isn't useful. Um, yeah. Anyway, back to NX. <laughs> and not really even NX. At this point, we're going to like start working on this library. So um, we installed Axios as a dependency, and I'm okay with that. Um, do we need the Axios types, or are those just built in? Here's something we, we learned when I was uh, teaching about TypeScript. If you look at a package on NPM, you can look at this little icon right here. And if the icon is blue, then that means the package includes TypeScript definitions by default. If the icon isn't blue and it looks like uh, this, that means you have to install the types separately, specifically in this case from uh, definitely typed. But because the types are built in, we don't need to install uh, something separately. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm drop dropping little little bits of knowledge here and there. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Joshua. Uh, okay, uh, I have learned. Great, great. Type one in chat if you just learned something. Um, let's work on this emote parser too. So, uh, to to bring it all back. Nice. I'm I'm glad some people learned some things. Um, I have a bunch of different repos with a bunch of code that's all like copy and pasted throughout. So this API repo is the back end that pulls in Twitch chat and YouTube chat and then makes them available over WebSockets for like this overlay. But one of the things that that back end does is it parses emotes. So if we look in here and we look in our lib folder, uh, parse emotes, um, this is the function we're gonna put in, into that package. But this code was literally copy pasted, um, I believe into, oh, into my, my stream overlay alerts. Um, so whenever someone, uh, gives bits or gives subs or, uh, or subscribes, uh, that overlay I wrote myself, but it also does emote parsing because sometimes people's messages have emotes in them. But if you look in here, it, l maybe not that, is it just in JS? Yeah, it literally has a parse emotes function. And this was literally copy pasted from here. So now the code lives in two separate repos. If I make changes one place, they don't get updated in the other. This is this is tech debt. This is what we're fixing right now by putting it into this into the shared library. Um, for now, I'm literally going to copy this code and um, put it in here. Um, but we'll we'll fix everything because now that we're using TypeScript. Uh, it'll potentially uh, catch some errors that we that we weren't getting before as well. Um, and also, we can start writing tests for it because um, we didn't have any tests for this at all. We just tested it live. Uh, okay, where to start? I guess we could start with a test. What do, what do I want to make sure this thing does? Um, Let's say that it ex uh, one one thing is we should export the regular expression that that uh, yeah we should uh, make the regular expression it should work it should just work <laughs> we should make that I think we should make our our specific regular expressions available um, 
Uh, it should export the emote regex. <laughs> the day has come where I'm actually writing tests. Um, okay. So uh, I, I, we can also think about this from a consumer standpoint. Like before even writing the code, in the test, we write what do we want? We, what do we want the code to do? What's up, Sir Tim? Welcome in. Um, eventually, yeah, the, I think the apps will be in the mono repo too. And at that point, it will actually start converting it to Feathers 5. Um, so I think something like, if we do like get emo regex, something like this, and it will, it'll, it'll re return a promise because uh, it has to call the API to actually get those emotes. Um, And then that will be an actual regular expression. Do we want to two string it? Can you two string a regular expression? I don't know. For now, this test will fail. Um, but let's let's make a function called get emote regex. That just returns all of it. So we're going to export a function called get emote regex. It's going to be an async function. Um, oh, we literally have one already. We have one already. So I'm just going to export that. And then we'll gradually fix the TypeScript errors and everything else. All right, let's run these tests. Um, it should. So there's no test runner in here. I'm curious if we run the test from the uh, the root repo. Yeah. This is what we need to figure out, Links Winter, because I, I don't have a I don't have an answer for that. Um, but I do believe, like, if we if we like run the build test, let's see, um, in the root. We don't have any scripts. It's curious to me that they they set up testing for us, but they didn't set up a um, um, they didn't set up a testing command. It has a build command. Oh, it does have a test command. It's in the project JSON, not in the package.json. Um Okay, let's look at their docs to see how do we run the tests. Specifically, we're running it with um, vtest. Oh, it's just nx test, and then the name of the a name of the package. Okay, so. Um, We are now in the root. If I do npx nx test emote parser, this should run the tests there. Great. That's good. <laughs> at least we at least we figured that out. Um, and then um, I'm thinking Link Winter. When you run the build command here, it's 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 actually going to import the other pack I guess if you're importing the built code from those other packages that's that's when you may need to set up specifically what order do they build in um but in my project the the way that, I, that I'm thinking about it is because everything is going to be typescript this package just imports the other package and so when this package builds it automatically also builds the imports as well um well, yeah, we'll, we'll figure. I guess we'll figure that out. Right now, we're only working with a single package. Once we have more, then, then we'll 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 have to know. Because at that point, like if I go in and modify emote parser, some other library that's dependent on it would need like the latest version and everything. Yeah. Um, okay, so we ran our tests. It failed, which is good. Um, but it also uh, it, like the network request failed too. So let's 
let's dive a little bit deeper. Um, right now, um, it's trying to request all of the emotes. You can two string a regex pattern. The thing is, emote regex is of any type. We need to give it some types so we can have some better editor support here. Like that. So now that I type that, it returns that, and then in the test, it knows that it's a regular expression. And so now I should be able to say like to string. Oh no no. Uh, the other thing is this is pulling in um, the Twitch channel name, and then I think also my Twitch ID. So we need to pass those in as arguments, I think. Like right now, uh, my code was, it was kind of just working at a global level. Like my code was just expecting Twitch channel ID to exist and Twitch channel name to exist. But now I think you should have to pass in the channel name or the channel ID um, when getting emotes. So we should do that here. Something like uh, channel name coding garden. Or no, it's coding garden. Um, channel ID. And then this would need to be my specific ID. Yeah. You know. Thanks. <laughs> I always forget what my ID is. Like, am I going to go look this up right now? Um, okay, so we we have we have that. Now I need to update this to actually take in uh, the channel ID, channel name, and channel ID. Let's think about, though, like, what's a better API for this? Like, it probably is a little bit simpler if I just do name and ID. Because we already know this, in, this is in the context of a Twitch channel. Um, so I like, I like that better. Okay. So let's make this work. Um, I'm going to need an interface. We're going to call it uh, channel info. And at this point, this might actually be a shared type because there's probably multiple places across my various co code bases that need channel name, channel ID. Um, so name is a string, ID is a string. Um, and then we can say that git emote regex takes in the uh, channel info, like this. Um, and then all of the other functions need to take that in as well, because uh, now instead of uh, using the thing globally, they're just going to use name or ID if they, if they actually need it. So we pass in the info here. And then all of those other functions need to... Uh, specify that here. Yeah, I think I think simple is simple is best. Like, especially if somebody else is using this library, name and ID makes makes the most sense. Um. Okay, and then we need to actually use it. So right here, instead of process.env, it'll just be info. ID. Like that. And then right here, instead of process.channel name, it'll be info.name. And here it'll be info.id. All right. We're closer. Um, now the request shouldn't fail, but the test will still fail because the thing we get back won't be a, won't be a banana. Here we go. All right, so there's the big old regular expression that represents every single emote from Better Twitch TV, uh, Franker Faces, and um, everything else. And uh, it is, it is it's coming back. Now, um, what's, what's, it's a big regular expression. What's, here's the thing. Should we, should we break it up though, right? So like, instead, <laughs> 
instead of responding with a giant regular expression, should we give back like three different regular expressions? Um, and then in each one, we can test for a specific emote that we know is supposed to exist. Hmm. And if that's the case, instead of one function called get emote regex, do we have multiple functions that are get better Twitch TV regular expression or? Yeah. Um. <laughs> What's up, Jarhead? Uh, we're, we're refactoring and testing my, my library here that parses emotes from Twitch. Um, okay. The other thing is we probably don't, I mean, I guess technically I am doing like caching here. Um, so that I don't hit their APIs to get the emotes constantly. You would, you would probably want to set the timeout, like when you're initializing the library too. Hmm. Does that mean we need to make it a class? Does that need, mean we need something like, uh, we need to create an emote parser? like this, and then once we have an emote parser, um, I mean, I kind of like this, because then when we create an emote parser, we pass in our settings, and now all the methods that we call will have those settings already available to us. Um, because we can also do something like we can override the, e the request timeout to be like 60 milliseconds. Yeah. Well, I mean... <laughs> That's, that's that's all it is. Like we 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 set up the mono repo. Now we got to get to coding, you know. Um, I like this better. So let's let's get this working. <laughs> I, I that's I think that's a great point, uh, uh, Presto as well. Is like we could we could actually mock the responses coming back from those APIs, uh, so that way we can actually test against them, and then we're not actually hitting the network when we run the tests. That's a that's a great idea. Um. We will do that next. But first, let's get this this thingy working. Um so should an instance of emote parser should require an ID and name. What if the API response changes and the test still pass? I mean, it's a good point to bring up. Like at this point, the thing is, if we actually we're actually calling those APIs, it's more of an integration test because we're testing our integration with these uh, these various services. Um, I kind of like that because Andrew's exactly right. If they change their API, which they did, they changed their the Seven TV API changed recently, which is why I had to go in and update this thing, um, and. The only way I had of knowing was the overlay stopped working. Um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Let's let's get this little class test working, and then we'll we'll think about it. We'll think about it more. So should require an ID and name, and then we should expect that emote parser that ID to be. This, so we pass in the info, and then we expect that info.id is right, and then emote parser.name is info.name, like that. Um, I'm gonna comment that test out for now. Is that how you comment out a test in vtest? Hmm. I think it would, maybe we do, yeah, I like, I like that, Andrew. So, um, mock, network, mock network responses for testable results. Um, and then we will need a, uh, separate integration test to make sure APIs are still working. And that, so this specifically will be testing, not, not this, but... We'll get there. We'll write the code for it. But this specifically will be testing that given some message, we can parse it 
in the way that we expect to, given that we already have the response back from the server. Is it it.skip? Thank you, uh, Variax. Oh, nice. Um, but it will be good to also have this little test that calls the APIs, and then if the APIs don't respond accordingly, it fails, and then now, yeah. <laughs> Testers like to write a lot of tests. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, and actually, I think we should make our class the default export. Emote, par emote parser should just be the default export, which is a class you can create an instance of. Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, this test should fail because we, um, we're not exporting anything. Yeah, so there, there, isn't, there isn't a default constructor here. Um, so I need to do something like export default. Actually, the way we have this set up, export star from emote parser. I'm trying to think if we will ever need to export multiple things. Yeah. Uh, it says there's an ad in two minutes and 43 seconds, but th yeah, thanks for the reminder, Chad. Um, yeah, Jarhead, I, I don't have the calendar updated right now, um, but um, I, try, I try my best to explain everything I'm doing, but it does get more advanced at certain points. Um, yeah, but so I set up the ad, I set up the ads so that uh, I no longer have pre-rolls. So when people come in, they don't see an ad as long as I run ads. I think I have to run like three minutes of ads every hour. But, you know, it, it is what it is. I also get to take a little break. Um, yeah, I think I just want to do export. Um, I think we just do an export default here. So we have a class called emote parser. And then we export it. Um, and then now our test is failing because the emote parser doesn't have an ID and doesn't have a name. Um, so here we need a constructor that takes in the uh, channel info and then just does this dot ID equals info dot ID and this dot uh, name equals info dot name. And then TypeScript is now complaining because we need to tell it that ID is a string and name is a string like this. Um, so now the test should pass, but at this point, we probably want a validator. Like if we install, um, Zod, we can actually validate the info object to make sure that ID and name exist on there and that, and that they're not empty. Um, so let's do that. Um, I like to use Zod. It is a schema validator. But what we can do is instead of just having this interface, I can create a validator that validates ID and name. And let's see if I can do it uh, before the ad starts. So import Z from Zod. And then I want to create uh, a channel info validator. I have 20 seconds. Val, I, it's not, not going to happen. Validator. And this is a Z.object. And then it also it has a name, which is Z.string which is required. Oh, it has an ID and a name. And there we go. And then we can say channel info is z.infer or instance of. OK, the ads are happening. I have to pause. <laughs> um. No, we we didn't we didn't we didn't we didn't uh, even have to discuss Zod. I was like, I'm using Zod. Some people have mentioned I should try Valabot. Maybe we'll do that on a a, a try day Friday. We try we try Valabot. 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 Yeah, I'll, I'll, let's read you another story. And I guess I'll run an ad break over on on YouTube too. Insert ad. Cool. I've never done that before. <laughs> All right. Um, All right. For context, this this book was was published in 1977. 
these stories are cautionary tales about computers and programming. Um, and they're somewhat dated because this did come out in 1977. Okay, this story is called Pooling Information with a Computer by Art Buckwald. Readers have been smiling over Art Buckwald's acute observations on modern life since his column first started appearing in the Paris edition of the New York Herald Tribune and thence in syndication around the world since 1962. His pearls of satire have been cast from Washington, D.C., where he still lives. Uh, Mr. Buckwald is the author of nearly two dozen books and is in wide demand everywhere as a lecturer and commentator. Uh, yeah, we have a disclaimer. Uh, okay. Some, okay, here's the story. Are you ready? <clears throat> Somewhere in this great land of ours, there is a computer stash full of information on you. Whenever you want a bank loan, a credit card, or a job, this computer will, in a manner of seconds, give some total stranger almost every detail of your life. Unfortunately for most of us, the computer is unable to discriminate between fact and malicious gossip, and once the informa information is fed into it, it stays there forever. The other day, I was considering going into a carpool with three other men, Hicks, Kroll, and Anderson. I have known these men casually for years, but when you join a carpool, you really want to know what they're like. So I asked a friend in the retail credit business if I could use his computer for a few hours. Actually, we'll go, we'll go here too. Um, he agreed, and I went there and typed out, What do you know about Hicks, Al, who lives at 43 Lover's Leap Terrace? The computer started chattering. Hicks Al, born October 23rd, 1925, bottle fed, bed wetter until seven years old. I typed back, forget about childhood and give me some other facts. The computer replied, Hicks has a domineering wife who the whole world thinks is sweet as maple syrup. Whenever she gets mad at him, she starts biting his nails. He start he she starts biting his nails. Uh, I typed back, I'm not interested in that. What's the condition of his car? The computer paused for a few seconds and then tapped out. Hicks owns a 1957 Buick convertible for which he is still paying $80 a month. It has been in the garage 33 times and has cost him $1,500 in repairs. Two of the springs in the backseat are broken and he needs new snow tires. He has the car washed once a month. <laughs> it added, Hicks never cheats on his wife, though he thinks about it a lot. That's enough, I told the computer. Now give me a rundown on Kroll HG, who lives at one lion's den circle. The tapes in the computer started turning furiously and finally stopped. The teletype began to chatter. Uh, Kroll HG had, had a strong mother who dressed him in silk sailor suits until he was 13 years old. <laughs> Get on with it, I typed impatiently. He owns a 1974 door Mercury sedan, which has special silk seat covers. Likes to dress up in his wife's clothes when children are at camp. That's enough. I typed angrily, what about Anderson EL, 198 Dover Cliffs? Anderson is having a big thing with a lady cosmetics buyer from Lord & Taylor. What about his car, I demanded. They don't use his car, they use hers. I didn't mean that. Is his automobile safe for our carpool? It is now, but if Mrs. Anderson ever finds out about the lady buyer, dot dot dot. Thank you very much, I typed. You've been most helpful. Don't mention it. Oh, by the way, when are you going to stop beating your wife? That took a turn, um, but if we can if we can focus on the fact that it turned into domestic violence at the end, um, I think Josh said it like, yeah, this is just he's just describing Facebook <laughs> in, in 1977. Uh, this this is just this is just the internet now. I mean, obviously it has more intricate details that you don't you can't necessarily get, but I think anybody that lives most of their lives online, uh, you can figure out a lot about them these days. Um, so yeah, a cautionary tale from. Uh, the early 20th century that basically describes how we live our lives today. All right, let's write some more code. Um, here's where we were at. Our class object accepts in an object that has, <laughs> but what about his car? <laughs> uh, that, I think that's what it is, Sir Tim. I think we'll have to fix it. So it accepts in an object, uh, but we want to validate that it has an ID and a name on it. So that's why I'm creating this validator here. So uh, I, this creates the validator, which is great, but I also want to be able to get this type because right now I have code duplications. I don't want to have to def define the interface and the validator. So what I can do is Zod has a built-in thing like this. Channel info validator like this. We'll have to look at the docs, but basically they have a way of extracting an interface or a type of that object, and then we can use that in our in our codes. Um, so let's see. Did 
Did I do it wrong? Oh, I did type of. Oh, good call. And then that becomes a type. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, but what's nice is now, if I look at this, it's basically like I defined that, that interface. And in, in this case, it created a type, but uh, it's, that would, this is interchangeable with the interface that I defined before. But it automatically gave that to me. All of my other codes still works because it's the same uh, shape as before. But now, 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 we can validate it. We can say... Um, channel info dot, uh, and actually I'm just going to call it channel info because the, the value and the type can have the same name and there's no, no, uh, no issue there. Zod will freak the potential browser. Look, we already have a dependency on Axios and on Zod, so... If, if, you, if you don't like my dependency choices, um, then uh, don't use my library, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, cool. So now, when someone creates an instance, we're validating that object uh, that gets passed in. Um, so in our tests, we should, we should make sure that, that the, the validation is running. So, um, if we pass in nothing, we, we need to expect that it throws an error. To throw? But let's just see what error we get first. Well, not that. <laughs> That's just a... um, serialized error. Um... Yeah. Should throw. An error if missing ID or name. And then should have an ID and name. Um, the error that we get back, does it just have a plain old error message? I think, I don't, I guess we don't even have to check the error message. I think we can literally just do this and say expect, expect this to throw like this. Do I try catch it? Um, I need to figure out how to do this. How do, how does V how does V test? How do I test an exception with V test? Yeah, maybe I need to wrap it and then check the error. I guess. Uh, I see. So you, I put it in a little function that it can call it. I mean, that's that's even easier, not easy enough. I can literally do this and then expect that to throw. Yeah, cool. Awesome. We're on our way. We we have an emote parser. It has uh, some initial settings. We make sure that it has an ID and a name. Great. Now at this point, we can try to uh, uh, parse some emotes. Um, so. I'm going to move this info so that it's shared out here so that every instance I create just has that info. Uh, for what I'm using index so far, it's fine. But right now I only have one, one, one library. Um, we'll start to see really how it works once I start adding other libraries and other apps, because right now I'm not really using the only features I've used of index are like the project scaffolding. Okay. Uh, create an emote parser. And then you do something like emote parser dot parse. 
And then we specifically want to test um, like pick an emote from a specific service. Yeah, I think I think that's one one thing to consider here is like, I mean, if they're using TypeScript, TypeScript would throw an error here because it just wouldn't let them create an instance. But technically, you could use this library with JavaScript. And I think I do want to let them know, hey, you forgot ID and name. Yeah, exactly what TypeScript tea time is saying is like, if they're not using TypeScript, it, it at least throws an error that says, hey, you forgot these two things. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I want to do this. I want to I want to parse a message that just has an emote in it. Um, but we'll pick one from each service. So like, uh, let's do um, better Twitch TV first. So um, I guess we do Franker faces. Press F. <laughs> um, yeah, I th I'm I'm going to get ahead of myself because I can't really even think about okay, what is the response going to be? How do I want to test that? I'm just going to get it working, and then we'll we'll potentially write some more tests after that because I still need, I need kind of need to figure out the API as well. Um, something like should return an emote object. Like one thing I wanted to do was make this thing give back a result that's similar to what TMIJS and like Twitch IRC does, where um, we can expect, do we have to deep equal? I think to equal does deep equality, but we should expect to get back um, an object. Actually, I'll have to look how and see how TMIJS does it, but something like the the range, of um yeah i was thinking about that too josh like i think there should be like a super method that can include everything honestly you might even include that in your constructor so like you can specify like ffz false like that um or bttv false like all of these default to true um but if you want to disable them something like that yeah, I, I I think I like I like where we're going there. Um, okay, uh, I need to see how TMIJS does this because I think it's like uh, the range of where the emote is. So uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then um, like the URL of of where that image is. Um, something like this. I think let's confirm that this is how TMIJS does it because I, I kind of want to copy that so that it's a similar like because I'm already running code that takes the emotes that that come back from um, Twitch IRC and uh, you could just re at this point you could potentially reuse that code with the response here. Um, is the real alcohol? He was earlier. I don't know if he still is. Um, events chat i see so it has the it's an object where the it has the id of the emote and then the range in in where that emote occurs yeah no worry sql gorster thank you for hanging out wait <laughs> are you actually here alka or uh okay so because if that's the case, nice, nice. Yeah, I was just I was uh, asking about how TMI responds with this emote object because that's what I want to do here. Because I might actually do something like um, FFZ is an object, then we have the ID, and then this this has an array that has zero through five in it. So like every occurrence of that emote gets specified here. Um, 
Um, something like this. Let's see, though. Let's see. Um, it's going to change what we're doing with the response of the of the library, though, or uh, the response from their API. But we say parse. This takes in uh, the message, which is a string. Um, and then right now, we're just going to get this global emote regex. I'm not going to export this anymore. Just, just to get this working, we'll get the regex. And then we do uh, message dot match. We pass in the regex. And then let's see what we get back. And I think I want match all. Yeah, I want match all because it'll match every occurrence of the thing. Just gives back all the matches and then we'll like reformat that. Um, okay, so uh, the test should fail because I get something completely different back. Um, well, let's see. Promise dot dot dot. Okay, <laughs> so first of all, uh, we need to await it. And then once we've awaited it, we should see what it gets back. Yeah, and so then this is the regular expression matcher. Um, I want to see the full thing. Let's see if this will output it. Um, this. Because you have index. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's figure out how to how to reformat this over here. Um, we're gonna have each individual match, and then we're building up an object. Um, and then we want to say. Yeah, I think that's how we'll do it, Joshua, is uh, start at the index they give us and then total length. Oh, yeah, no, and no worries, Alka. Yeah, they were just mentioning it because I was literally looking at, at TMIJS. Um, but yeah, I'm not so much worried about how they parse it. I want my emote parsed response to just be the same as, as what TMI is returning. Basically, I want to return an object that looks like this, but for franker faces and better Twitch TV. That's that's really all I'm, I'm working on here. Um. Okay. Now we can say all at, uh, we need to find the ID. And right now we have this big old thing of emotes. Um, and we can say match at z zero, I think. Because um, emotes is a, I think it's just right now it's just a record string string but we'll have to update that later i think anyways um Yeah, I think I'm going to get, I have to contemplate that. Like, do I just give back IDs or do I give back full URLs? Because a lot of 
if I give back the full URL, it makes it so much easier than trying to figure out and construct the CDN URL. Yeah. So typically, Moshiko, you probably have a separate test file for each type of thing that you're testing. Um, describe is a suite. And so right now, this is the suite for emote parser. Probably all of the tests for emote parser are going to go inside this one describe. If I ever do something else, I might have another describe. And if it's completely unrelated, I would have a separate test file altogether. Um, yeah. Okay. This gives us back the emote match. I th okay. I think... We call append emote. What does append emote do? Um, it grabs the code, the source, and the URL. We say emotes at the code is the URL, and emotes at that source is that source. But what we could do um, is instead of being a record string string, we could be a record string, which is the emote name, I guess. And then we could we could put a little object right here that has like ID, um, URL, and service. Nice, Chad. <laughs> You're on the Christmas tree. I think, I think. And then now, um, Well, code source and URL. Maybe we'll just maybe we'll just reuse these properties because we're always already using those elsewhere. Um, and selector is a function that returns. I need to put this in a type now. Uh, it says add break in one minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll, we're, we'll finish this up and then we'll take a break. Um, I need a... I guess, do people just use type these days? <laughs> uh, instead of interface? I think that's what I was getting from, from a lot of people. Just use the type keyword. But yeah, we have emote. Now this is a function that returns an emote. Um, and now we know that... Um, Emotes at code, instead of being the URL, we can grab the, grab the whole thing. Place it there. But what that means is now, there's a bunch of errors in my code. I know, I know, I know, I know. But um, what that means is over here, this now should have, yeah, this is now an emote. It has all the other things that we were expecting. So... Uh, we can say all at emote.code equals um, I guess for now we'll just do emote.url um, and then this is just a record string string Hedgecript Tea Time says they switched to type completely and haven't run into any issues then. Okay. So uh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna finish this off when the ad break is over. Oh, thank you, Pawan. You're too kind. Thank <laughs> you, thank you for the gift. Um yeah. cool. Um what am I going to do for the next... How late? How long is... Oh, wait. Was the ad already going? The ad already happened? I can't tell. Yeah, I I, I, I think I prefer the ads to be more frequent while, with taking breaks so that people don't get pre-rolls. Um, 
Well, apparently I just talked through an ad. <laughs> let, me, let me give you a recap then. Um, and also trust ask is saying, why do I prefer an object over a map? Only because I'm updating old JavaScript code. Yeah, I think it, you're, you're completely right. In this case, it would make sense to just make it a map. Um, but I was updating old code and so like I wasn't completely sure what the stuff was, but yeah, you're completely right. That, that would make more sense to be, to be a map. And then down here, this will fix my code too. If I just say this is a, a new map of string string. Um, well, then it has no index signature. That's in this case, that's why I'm using a record because I want to use the index signature. I guess technically I can say uh, set like this. Um, and then that fixes that. Yeah. Um, and then in this case, I need to do get. That's that's why I didn't. That's why I didn't. Um, we need to keep this one a record because all of my other code. Um, is expecting it to be an object. I, I'll, I'll update it later, but that's the main issue. Is all my other code is using bracket notation. It's not using get and set. Okay, we got rid of all the errors here. Let's see what we get back now. Should give us back an object. Um, yeah, look at that. So it it's it's a map. It has press F and then it says the URL. But what we actually want is we want a um Yeah, we almost just want a, like an array of all the occurrences. We don't never really we don't really even want an object. I think it does, Mark, because I'm seeing in the... I don't know. I actually don't know if it's IRC, but... Um, um, at this point, I'm... Yeah, I, I think that makes sense, right? Josh is like, if we have the FFZ, which is an array. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. Um, so, like, we have an object. FFZ is an array. We'll define what that type is. And then we have BTTV. And then we have uh, 7TV. Um, but this is going to be an array of what? An array of emotes. Yeah, we'll, we'll literally spe we'll specify wh where did it occur, the URL and the code. Simple, simple as. Um... We call this emote result. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So we have emote result. Um, here we go. This is emote combined with um, location which is, actually, no, we can have start, which is a number, and end, which is a number. Hmm. How do I specify the type of a reduce? Like, how can I tell it that this is an emo result? Oh, I can do this. as cool but then um then it's it's not a map anymore because we need to say um all at emote dot source dot push we push in the emote the start is going to be our match dot Um, the regular expression response had the match in it. Um, where was that?
right here. Index. Index is what we want. And then end is match.index plus um, emote.code.length. Um, and then we we need another, we we're, get, we're getting a lot of types here. <laughs> okay, let me let me consolidate these types though. So uh, we have emote result, which is a combined emote with start and end. But we also need uh, emote type. So source instead of just being a string, um, we can we can create a, a a union type that says what it's going to be. So I do believe in my codes. I I capitalize it like this. Like that. And so then we can say source is that emote source. Um, and um, where did I define emote result? Oh, wait. Where's emote result? Oh, it's this. But that's not an emote result. That I mean, that's a specific emote result. We just want our emotes to be this, where we have key of key of type of. Or oh, no, 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 no. The key is an emote source, and we'll figure out how. I gotta figure out the syntax for that. But then the value is an array of emote result, like that. Um. Type of? Is it key of type of? <laughs> uh, is it key? How do how do I tell it that uh, this will be an object whose keys are one of these? Key in. Yeah, rock and roll. Thank you. <laughs> so what this says is we're gonna have an object. The the properties are gonna be FFC, BTTV, and seven TV, and then the their values are going to be an array of these. Wonderful. Um, so uh, this should complain because now we need um, to do the thing. Um, Cool. Um, here's the thing. If there was a match, why would index be undefined? Can we just we just know it's good. Can we just do this? Let's do this. All right. Hey. Now we're cooking. So... Uh, FFZ is an array. There's an occurrence of each emote. We have the code. I guess we don't. We actually don't need the source anymore because it's it's nested. I guess eh, we'll, we'll keep it. It's technically nested under FFC, but we're still telling it what the source is. Yeah. Hey, Brooks. Welcome in, Raiders. Um. We're writing some TypeScript code. Welcome in. Good to see you. Brooks Brooks is a good friend. Um, you should definitely go check out his channel. And uh, what were you working on? Building my own Git in Rust. But why? <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> um... That's awesome. But yeah, definitely go drop a follow on Brooks. Uh, I used to work with him, and we, we hang out every now and then. Alka says, I'd put them all in one array. I, I'm starting to feel like I should do that as well. Unless you, like, ask for it. I kind of just want to put it in a single... I, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, and at this point, it, it wouldn't even be a reduce. It would just be a mat.
Oh, code crack. They have a specific challenge. I see. Um. Yeah, I think I think I like this better. So we're now we now just give back an object. We say what the code was, when it started and ended, and then what the URL is. Um, I guess the issue is we are just always assuming they want so, like the biggest size. That's I that's the tricky part of just like giving them the um, the whole thing. Is they could specify the size themselves, but uh, <laughs> I, I digress. Well, welcome in Raiders. Glad to have you. Uh, this is the coding garden, and uh, right now I uh, set up a mono repo. So we are learning about NX, and I set up a basic mono repo, and now we're knee deep in some codes that does emote parsing for Twitch messages. So um, I wrote a bunch. I have a bunch of custom overlays. Like this is a custom chat overlay. And then, like, there's a custom overlay that shows up for bits and subs and stuff like that. And they both have to do the work of parsing emotes. And so one of the first things I'm doing in the mono repo is uh, porting this library to be reusable and also tested and written in TypeScript. Uh, and so that's what we're working on now is, like, an emote parser that parses for all the various uh, emote services you might use. Um, so... Yeah, at this point, this is where maybe I have base URL and then we specify the available sizes. I think I like that. Let's do that. Um, so now, for instance, when we're parsing better Twitch TV, um, Oh, I guess no. Right now we're parsing Franker Franker phases. Um, that's another good point, Joshua. So basically, it's kind of like two different ways to go about it. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll think about how do I want to do it. But we could have yes, yeah, go creep. We could have. Uh, Default size, but I, I think I'm going to respond with all sizes because depending on where you use it, you might want the bigger one or the smaller one. Um, so I think that's why I'm going to I'm going to give them back all of them because otherwise, like I don't I don't want there to be too much configuration, right? It's kind of just like make it as simple as possible and just give them back what they want or what they need. Um, okay. Now we're going to do something fun. We're going to generate some types. So uh, this is the API response from the Franker Faces global emote response. Uh, so I'm going to generate a type based on this. And actually, I think I'm going to... Do I put it in a separate repo? Um, or do I just put it in this repo? Because that's one of the other aspects of this mono repo is we potentially we're going to have a, a, a different uh, lib just called like types and then um, put our types in there. I kind of like the idea of creating a separate lib because then that's another thing people might use our library for is like if you're calling the Franker Faces API, you can install my library to get the types. Um, so why not? Let's do it. We're in the root here. We're going to generate another lib, but this won't be emote parser. We're just going to call this types. And this specifically will be a library that just exports a bunch of reusable types that I'm going to be using in all of my packages. Uh, no tests. It will just be TypeScript types. Cool. But now you'll get to see how one package in the mono repo depends on the other. Um, so if I go in here to packages slash types, um, 
Can NX deal with a mix of languages? It can. It can. Uh, I haven't. This is my first time using it. But if you look at their docs, they have generators for Go, for .NET. Um, so far, it's been really good for TypeScript. Like it generates all our TypeScript configs and everything else that we would want. Um, yeah. Okay. We're gonna create a ff. We're gonna create a folder called emotes, and then a file called ffz. Dot ts, and then um, I have this paste JSON as types. Uh, the top is going to be ffz response. Cool. So um, this, these are the types generated by analyzing the JSON response here. Um, and now. Um, I want to export them. Here's the thing. If I just leave it in here and like I don't have like a, a main or a default export, because I want re to reference this dire directly, I think. You can use index, index standalone, yeah, because they, they have project generators. And so you could just use NX for generating your projects and like don't use any of the, the mono repo stuff. Um, okay. Let's just figure out how do I import this type now from this sub library? Because if we go back over to emote parser, we can look at the, we can look at the top level. So at the top level, I have this packages folder. And then now I have two packages. I have emote parser, which we've been working in. And then I just created this new types library. Um, uh, why don't let the types in the lib itself yeah, I think that's what I'm getting at, Lynx, is like, I won't I won't export everything. They'll just live here without like those default exports. And then I will import this directly if I need it. Is that is that what you're getting at? Because that's what I'm figuring out right now. It's like, okay, now I need to use these types in Emote Parser. Um, first of all, I need to install types into Emote Parser. Um, how do I do that? I don't know. Um... So I th if I do an npm install of types, it's not going to work, is it? Start by building the types package. Well, it's, it needs to be listed as a dependency because I don't want to import it with like a relative file path. We probably just need to head to the, the NX docs at this point. Um, like if we look at their package based mono repo, create a package, build it local linking of packages is what we want. Um, is this telling me to manually put it in my package JSON? I think it's telling me to manually put it in my package.json. I can't install it. Oh yeah, there is an ad break. We'll pause. <laughs> we'll pause for ads. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do next. <laughs> I'm going to wait for the ad to be over. But yeah, I think I'm literally just going to install types and see what happens. See if it tries to pull it from NPM or if it just gets the, the one locally.
I don't think if mom will check. I think you meant NPM. <laughs> it's like autocorrect. Um, mom will tell us if it's if it's if it's a workspace package. Um, I, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, maybe maybe only certain people got ads, but it definitely said they were running. Okay, ads are over. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm just going to run this command. So I'm currently in emote parser. I'm going to do npmi types and see if it actually pulls in the, the library that I created. What? <laughs> that's, that's so weird. Can't set properties of null setting dev. Um... 0 0.0.1 0 .1. I guess I didn't even see what is my what is my version oh it is okay I think I do I think here's the other thing is I do want to scope it it's like I need to change the name here the name should actually be um coding garden slash types is there a namespace property how do you how do you namespace a namespace a package? Yeah, or or we use we use greenhouse. Oh, it has to be all lowercase. Is that the issue? Okay, we removed it. Now, if we do npm i greenhouse types. It still technically adds, so it's working, but some something weird is happening. Maybe it's because I maybe it's because I didn't build. Did we build this, or do we build here? <laughs> um, I am I'm, I'm all over the place. Regardless, now that it's installed, I think I can just import it. I can import from it. Like, let's see. Uh, like over here, if I do um, import type FFZ response from greenhouse types slash source slash lib slash emotes slash FFZ. I don't like that that full import path. I think I'll have to fix the import path. Yeah. What's up, Pablo? At this point, we're just working on our emote parsing library. Uh, we did just create a second library called Greenhouse Types that we're trying to import from now. Um, so like this technically works, but I I want I think I want the import path to just be this, like that. Um but let's see if, if this type actually works because um, now right here, we can say that with Axios, that the response is going to be an FFC response, which then types sets. Because um, then we do sets at three. Fascinating. Um, the mapping should happen automatically, Limotes is saying. So, like, I don't even need... But the thing is, I would want it listed as a dependency. I don't want to just import it without listing it as a dependency. But are you saying... Um, oh. The path exists, so I can literally just import from types. I see. It's true. <laughs> it's true. TypeScript tea time. We're uh, um, we're in the the configs. Cool. Let's try that then. Um, the thing is, well, but like I said, I would still I still want it listed in my dependencies because I'm gonna publish emote parser, and if I publish emote parser, I'm gonna need to publish greenhouse types as well. Um, we need to make everything namespaced at this point though um 
No worries, Joshua. Thanks, thanks for all your, your help and thanks for hanging out. Um, yes, I I'm, I'm think I'm going to have to rename it everywhere. Um, I, need, I need to look at the NX docs. Like, how, how do I... Is namespacing... Um, I guess, do I just put that in my package name? I, 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 think my, I might have to update it manually everywhere. But like... Um, Like this, I want those to be that. Um, I kind of want to see where 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 is everywhere that emote parser is referenced. And there's a cache. Is that all I need to do? Yeah. Um, let's do something like rename package. Oh. Oh no. These packages are no. That's just internal. Rename the file or the folder. Uh, NX rename package name, change package name. This is changing the whole folder name. Uh, <laughs> can I get you a job? I can't get you one directly, but if you watch long enough, maybe you'll learn, you'll learn enough to get a job. Uh, change package name. <laughs> all right i didn't have to change it in too many places like i um i just changed it in the package.json i think pr i probably have to change it in the package json too or the project json Yeah, it's for the dependency and then the import path. No, I, I got a M1 MacBook Pro last year. That's what I'm that's what I'm coding on right now. Um I think I I think I mentioned it in my my setup. Mm, what MacBook do I have? Yeah. This is this is the MacBook that I have. Okay. Um this seems fine. Now, uh, let's see if I, let's see if the test still pass. Let's see if the code still runs. Um, so first of all, that's good. It couldn't find the project because I need to namespace it. It found it. It ran the tests. Great. <laughs> I think. I think I think that's that's all I can ask for. Like that's good enough. Um, the one thing I want to fix right now is uh, the import path, because this is a very cumbersome import path. Yeah, test failed successfully. Exactly. Um, this is a very cumbersome import path. I think I literally just want it to be this. Like there will be no source directory in. Um, uh, in the types library. Mm, I mean, I got the I got the MacBook at I think around Christmas last year. So whatever the the Apple sale price was at Christmas last year. 
Um, here's the thing. Do I have to change? Like, we have an output directory. Would this be something I just changed from my build? So when building, don't output to the source directory? Package.json exports? I've never used that before. Oh, no, that's, that's a webpack. The module path that is resolved when the specifier is imported. Set to null to disallow importing this module. Yeah, I like this keyboard a lot, Capoli. Um, of all the inexpensive mechanical keyboards I've gotten, this one's my favorite. So yeah, I can recommend it. Um, if you look on my gear page, I have a bunch of other cheap ones that I've tried. Um, Honestly, not not a bad not a bad one in, in the batch. Um, like this, these like the Red Dragon, the L and the E Element. All of these you can get for like under forty bucks on Amazon. And then this one I think is like fifty or sixty, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, this one especially because it has. So I use it via plugging it in, but it also has Bluetooth and uh, two point four gigahertz. Um, and these, I think, are brown switches. I specifically got brown because I wanted them to not be as loud. Uh, let's see what I link to. Um, looks like they only come with reds or blues. I'd have to look at my order history, but I, I, I feel like I got browns because I, I wanted them to not be as loud. I'll have to look later. Is this what you're saying? Links? Export this thing. Hmm. Exports to define the import targets. Okay. So exports, I, I, I want to find the, find the docs on this because I, I didn't see it on the page that I was on. Um, am I in the right? This is version six. Here we go, version 10. I stream on both uh, Twitch and YouTube now. Um, is exports an NX thing? Not, or like a workspaces thing? Yeah, help me find some docs on this. I literally, it's not even listed in the, um, at least the page I was on. Oh, this is a Node.js feature. Yeah, this, this is different than NPM. Is that okay? Okay. I see. 
I don't want to have to list every single thing I define in my types, though. <laughs> um, so yeah, it is a package.json thing, but it's defined by Node.js, and I guess it's a part of the Node resolution, n Node mod, Node module resolution algorithm. It'll look at the exports property. Um, yeah, I I don't want to write all of this manually. I really don't. Um, Oh, fascinating, Mark Boots. I don't want to do it manually, which means... Um, what if I just... Can't, can't, will, will you all be mad if I just got rid of the source directory? Like, this, this library will literally not have source code. It's literally only going to be types. Um... And then, like, put this here, delete the source directory, and then everything will just uh, work from that point. Um, and then, um, Yeah, maybe then there will just be no entry point. How about that? <laughs> put it, put it back. <laughs> I probably just broke. I broke. I broke something for sure. But let's see. Um. Let's see. Why is this complaining? What is it? what? Okay, file types index. We do want an index.ts. At least that's what TypeScript is complaining about. What? I don't know. I don't still understand why it's why it's complaining. Um, okay, let's see if I broke anything over here. Like over here, yeah, so that breaks the import. And then now I can just import this. Yeah, right? That's, that's, this, is really, this is really all I wanted. Because at this point, I'm just going to be defining a bunch of types in here uh, that, that we can import. This, this may be affected. This may affect the, uh, the build process. Unable to load. Lib source lib no such file. Okay. Who else is trying to use this? Hmm. Our, um, uh... Our packages. Was there something in the TS config? Seems fine, right? Oh, source root. It's unfortunately, it's it's unfortunate that I did all of this manually, but um, this is what I need to change. I think the yeah the file map gets generated, that gets generated. 
Um, and then this needs to just be this. Okay. Now with all of that, um, we still have this blank index. <laughs> uh, just import the things you need manually for now. Eventually, we could import all of our stuff and export it from here, so that way people don't have to use the directory, but the directory path. Uh, <laughs> I blame Axios for this. I don't. Um, Axios, Axios has nothing, nothing to do. Cool. Um, I mean, it didn't fail for the other reason. We can specify the project, so greenhouse types. It built it, great. And then um, greenhouse emote parser. Um, yeah, there's type errors, but I think we're on the right track. Okay, uh, we're <laughs> all of that. So now over here, I have these Franker face uh, types, um, which means that um, if we look at this, when we do emoticons, this is an array of emotic emoticon. Um, and then this needs to be uh, a different, potentially the same type, though. Yeah. This is, I think even the, the named response responds differently. All right, we're, we're on an ad break. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll take, a, take a quick break. Uh, but I can do that. And now both of these responses are typed. So like this has an array of emoticon and this has an array of emoticon. And then we'll, we, from there we can fix the type errors in here too. But let's take a quick break. This, uh, that's a bug. <laughs> it's got a little float, a floating. Uh... Hmm. I could read us a story, but um, I'm starting. I'm starting to think I should uh, audit these stories before I read them out loud. Because the last one ended with domestic violence, and then there was another one that was, I was reading yesterday that was a little bit sexist. So this, this book is pretty dated, honestly. Um, this could use some validation rather than just adding generic. Uh, what do you mean by that, uh, Pablo? In terms of like how I'm getting back the response? You're saying I should like validate the response? All right, ad break over. Oh, I see, Pablo. Um, I'm not really doing anything beyond beyond like using the array of emotes. I think we're just gonna have a test that. Well, I was gonna say we're having we we would have a test that validates the API response, but really that's only useful for our library. Once the library is published, it'll just break if if the APIs ever um, stop responding in the correct way. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all is an array of emoticon. Um, and then what is append em append emote takes in a selector and then does the thing. Um, and then this whole thing is the selector. I see. So I need to tell it that this is of type. Emoticon.
here's the thing. I want all of these to be namespaced to FFC as well, because um, right now, like it, I mean, I guess I could do as FFC emoticon, but this, this could get messy once I'm importing from a bunch of other ones. So over in my types library, um, I kind of want to rename all of the, I want to namespace all of these with FFC. Oh, well, I'll have to rename them so all of the references get renamed. Like that. Namespacing, yeah. Oh, can I do that? That's what I will do then. <laughs> I like that better. Um, that sounds way better. No namespaces. <laughs> it's 2015 mod. That's my linter error. Uh, I can ignore my linter error. Um, and then why is this complaining? FSC. Can I export it? Whoa, look at us. Okay, now we're exporting an entire namespace. Um, awesome. Now over here, this is all broken, but um, now we just import FFZ. And then down here, FFZ dot Wow. Namespaces are cool. Look at that. Wow, and then FFC dot emoticon. Nice. Okay. Um, it's not assignable to this type. What is this type? Oh, it's in. Oh. It does have a URLs property. Oh, because it's missing all of the other properties. Um, I think I could I could also just change it to a default export. Can you well can you not have a namespace as the default export? Hmm. I know nothing about TypeScript, but I'm liking TypeScript. TypeScript is pretty cool. TypeScript is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I guess I technically want a partial type here. Um, it's a get a little bit ugly, but like I could say uh, name. Is a string and URLs are ffz emoticon u like that why do i need a namespace at all well what uh, uh later on i'm going to have all of those very similar types but it's going to be for better twitch tv and then another one for 7 tv so I do like the idea of doing like ffz.response because later on I'll do bttv.response and it will be different than this. Um, there is a pick. I think my, I think my, uh, um, my types are just wrong in general. I, I need to figure out what this function is doing again. What do you mean, America 2050? What do you mean they'll they'll bite us? 
Um, okay. Namespace enforces the FFC compared to import star as FFC. I think so. Yeah, because if I... Well, no, no, never, never mind. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, if we do this, then it's probably just going to be uh, FFC dot ffc dot, dot each of those things i see what you're saying and then if we didn't put it in a namespace then people that import it can just call it whatever they want um i think i prefer this because we're gonna have so many types that have the same name like bttv is gonna have a response type um 7 tv is gonna have a response type and if we don't do this for the user like the people using our library um then it's up to them and it makes it trickier. I, I don't know. I, I do think I like this though. Yeah, that, that's my reasoning is like for the end developer user that uses this library, it's easier to just import a namespace. Maybe we do that too, Alka. That'll make it an easier, like it'd be great if we, if we could just import it directly, right? If, we, if the import looked like this, that would be awesome. Um, and I think we can set that up, right? So like in, oh no, never mind. I guess later on, yeah, late, actually we could do this, emotes and then FFZ like this, because later on we could import all of the namespaces in there. And then of course you could, you could pull it in directly if you wanted, but yeah, I like this idea. Um, so export star from will that work yeah that will work and then later on um we'll create bttv and then we'll export it here too and then that should that should be exported as BTTV. Uh, partial type might work. I still need to just figure out what I'm trying to do here. So <laughs> append emote is a function that takes in a function. But let me just extract this really quick and call it selector because this, this is my selector function. And so the selector function... Um, all right, great. Now we have the type because we can say... Uh, grab the first URL. It's possibly undefined. Um, in this case, this is why, okay, now, now I'm remembering. This is why we wanted the type. We don't just want to grab the first URL. Now we want to give them all of the URLs. Um, but we're going to try to format it in a nice, nice way. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, it, basically I take all of the things and just append it to a big old regular expression. That's why I called it the appenderizer 9000. Um, but let's look at this response. So if we look at a specific uh, emote, like this one, it has URLs, and then URLs have sizes. Um, I think I'm literally just going to, for specifically for Franker faces, we're just going to return URLs object. Um, It's interesting, in this case, I was making, forcing it to be HTTPS. Do I still need to do that? Maybe that was like an old thing we used to... I say that. <laughs> it probably will break. Um... Yeah, it should be fine, right? It should be fine. <laughs> it should be fine. Um, like this. Um... Cool, but that gives us back all the URLs. And so now um, we will have access to all of those in, in the thing we get back here. URL is undefined. Um, oh, that's because now in the appenderizer 9000, um, we want to grab 
URLs as well. And then we can define this type over here. So um, URLs, I think it's just a record string string because the uh, the size people will um, will choose which one they want, like one, two, three, or four. Um, and then we don't grab URL anymore. We just grab the URLs. All right. Now what? Yeah, we're going to do that eventually, uh, American 2050, is uh, just validate that the responses we're getting are, are correct. Um, but I think we've finally done it. So when we parse this message, we found the code. It started at zero. It ends at six. The source is Franker faces. And then these are the possible URLs you can use. There's a little bit of duplication. Like we could have like a base URL and then sizes. I'm okay. I'm okay with just giving back all the URLs. It makes it easier in the code, even the code that I write that's going to consume this because it can just grab the URL of the one that it wants. Um, cool. Uh, let's do better Twitch TV next, and then we can start to standardize. So we can we can see what do we get back from better Twitch TV. Maybe we should change the, 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 these sizes here to be something consistent if it's not for better Twitch TV. Um, but let's do that next. And, also make, and let's also make sure that we get rid of all our type errors for FFC. So uh, right now, it doesn't like my selector. Um, Why not? Oh. Input is the any type. Yeah, unknown. Input is unknown and returns an emote. And that should, I think that type will, oh, I thought it would. Because like, I'm basically saying, I don't know what this is going to be because everyone is going to do, some, do something different. Um. URLs is not assignable to parameter of type. Yeah, I, I guess they define the URLs type slightly different in the, um, like, it's not a record string string in their type. URLs is a um, key string string object. Well, it still doesn't like that. Oh. And then I, I actually will make this the any type. Well. Oh. Um. And then source. Emote source. I feel like can't we just specify that specify that as FFC? Hmm. Uh, Mayafum, thank you for the, the Prime. Appreciate that. Do I need... I don't... It's not an array. I don't think I need... Oh. On the type. I can tell it that it's a constant type. You're completely right. Huh. Why? <laughs> Why? Um, I guess if I do it there, but you're saying also it'll work here. I see, because it's like, it's like you shouldn't, source should not be changeable. 
I guess I could also say as um, emote source. This feels like why I would want a, an enum. <laughs> I know em enums are very controversial in the TypeScript world. But if I had an enum, then I could do this. Um, something like this. And like this, and then I think I need. <laughs> Is it a. Uh... Oh, I need the equal sign, equal sign. And then it does use commas. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Right? <laughs> right? And then now that I have this enum, it's a string string enum or enum. Um I can right here just say this.fmc. Like I, I prefer this sent syntax versus like as const or as the type. Like this literally just grabs the the exact string. Um <laughs> Okay, there we go. I need single quote single quotes anyways. Uh that's funny. Create a const object. Ah, look, it's an enum. Listen, my career started in C sharp. We used enums a lot. This looks like a perfect spot for an enum. Well, here's the thing. Enums are bad if you're not using a string enum, right? If you do this, then all of your values are numbers because that's how enums work. Um, but if you make them a string enum, you know, it, it, they're not numbers. <laughs> they're, they're, they're literally the string values. And then the other thing is when this code gets uh, compiled, enum is a type, but it's also a value. It's also like an object. Yeah. It's because they didn't have literal strings at the beginning of your career. Yeah, but I, I honestly, like, I don't, I don't know if I've ever, like, almost every time I start creating a, a like a, a conch string type like this, um, it's like once I get past, um, only two or three of them, like ergonomically, it just starts making more sense to, to use a, uh, an enum. I'm not going to argue about it. Look, this works and, but well, here's, here's the argument we can have. Here's the argument. Here, here's where we can, uh talk about what we prefer um because it's right here it's right would you rather see code that looks like this or would you rather see code that looks like this um or would you rather see code that looks like this um or yeah, I think you could also do something like this. Like if we if we tell it that this whole thing is an emote, um, then it's also happy there too. Yeah. Oh, ad break. But yeah, but here, here's the other thing is, um, um, I guess I, I'll, I'll finish, I'll finish after the, I'm just going to stand here in silence. Actually, I'll, I'm going to show you my guitar that I've been working on. Check it out. So uh, yesterday, I uh, installed these new pickups. Um, like I had to solder it and everything, and I, I swapped out the um, the knobs. Um, they had like these 
older flat looking knobs with like numbers on them. And so I put these nice little like metal knobs on there. And just last week I put a new neck on it. Um, I'll show you the neck it came with is ugly. So this is, this is called a Starcaster. It's a, a hollow body, uh, but this is the neck it came with. Look how, look how ugly that is. It's like, it's like the weirdest looking neck ever. Um, so I, I got this neck on eBay and uh, I had to, I had to drill the holes and everything to get it in there. Uh, but it's coming along. It's coming along. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a racing stripe, like with a black vinyl. And maybe put some stickers on it too. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I, I, it plays great. I like it. Ooh, okay. Uh, it is big, yeah. So it, it's actually inspired by by the guitars that Tom DeLong uses from Blink One Eighty Two. Um, let's take let's take a quick not not R slash Tom DeLong Tom DeLong guitars. Let's take a quick break to to talk about this. Because um, his old signature model is uh like this it's just a classic um single humbucker telecaster no Str stratocaster sorry Sing single humbucker stratocaster that's his old guitar but more recently he's been playing custom starcasters which are the hollow bodies yeah it's a strat stratocaster um and so mm, no not that one um and not even this one he's had a couple of different signature guitars uh this one was from gibson and epiphone but then recently he went back to fender and so he has a hollow body with fender so that's basically what i'm like recreating um let me let me find you a good picture of like the ones that he uses And then this subreddit is just is just people like recreating them like like I'm doing. Um, this one, this is a really good article, uh, because he had these Starcasters custom made by the uh, Fender um, Luthiers, Brian Thrasher is the dude that made them, um, because like I showed you, the Starcasters typically come with like this weird neck. They come with like two pickups. And Tom DeLonge's style is to have a single pickup, and then, like, he really likes that neck. So these were initially made for Tom, and then I think eventually he's going to have, like, a, a production model that they sell. But in the meantime, I'm making my own version of it. Okay. Um, back to the code. <laughs> we were talking about uh, opinions on, like, the best way to write this. The, right, the best way to write this. Um, I, I prefer this with the enum because I don't have quotes in my code. Now, like technically, uh, because I'm using TypeScript, it's going to help me out here. So because I said as emote, now it should help me and tell me all of my options, or does it? I guess this doesn't even tell me. Um, I guess I get a type error if I type the wrong one in there. Um, yeah, but not for as. I guess... I guess I would have to do this. And then return it. Um, and then uh, this. Um, really? Oh, because, yeah, because I changed it to an enum. Um, if we go back to it being... Um, a, a type. Okay, so let's say we have the, the type like that. Uh, now, I should get type completion when I'm typing in here. So yeah, this tells me these are the two possible things that you could write in here. Great. So I don't have to type it out manually. Uh, and if I do something that's not of that type, it's, it's going to yell at me. Um, but if we did it 
did it the other way if I like because I want to return it. Um, I don't like the fact that like I, I mean it could be like my my setup here, but I'm not. I don't get type completion. Well, actually, maybe I will. Um, if I do this, yeah, okay. So I do get type completion if I'm using it as my as as the source though. Um, does that work? Alka? I've never even seen that syntax before. Wow. I've never seen that TypeScript syntax. Um, cool. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to go about it. I just don't like, I don't like the, um, I, I guess, yeah, that's another, that's another good point. I could put a return type. If I put a return type, then it'll, it'll yell at me. So like right now, it doesn't yell, but then if I say, um, how do how do return types work? Right here. Yeah. Now if I say it returns an emote, then I can get some type completion there. But uh, again, I I don't like I don't like seeing the I don't like seeing single quotes in the code base. I think it, it kind of just comes from uh, having worked in C sharp and like a statically typed language. Having strings everywhere just feels weird. Um, but since we are in TypeScript, like technically these strings are constants and they are type checked, like you can't just put anything like TypeScript is going to yell at you. Um, so it's, it's really just a matter of preference. Like I really like to just do this. <laughs> and, and now, especially when I look at the code, um, it's not a string in the code. It's like a reference. It's a it's a lookup value, basically. Um, yeah. And then I don't and then I don't need to specify the type of the return or even the return type. Um if we if we go back to the enum. Because now, like TypeScript doesn't have to worry about, oh well, am I checking the right type of the string or whatever else? Um no, it's just it's it's it can only be of that enum because I'm referencing it from the enum. I don't know. Default GN, thank you for the prime. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, people have opinions about this. People, people will will go to war over this. Uh, I like enums. We're gonna use an enum, um, and we fixed all the type errors in here. Um, this number seems to be hard coded, though. Where is this number coming from? Uh, we need to look at the response for coding garden. Oh, good call. Um, yeah, and see you later, TypeScript Tea Time. Thank you for hanging out. And uh, do you still do you still stream? Definitely go go drop a follow if they do. Back in TypeScript land. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Have a good one. Uh, yeah, that's that's the other thing I didn't mention, which Pablo was saying is instead of doing an enum, you can create an object. Nice. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for dropping in. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for uh, hanging out today. Uh, cause you could, you can create an object called emote source. Define it the same way you define the enum. Uh, but I, I, like as an object like this, but then if you add as cons, that tells TypeScript that this object is never going to change. So, it behaves exactly like an enum. Um, <laughs> my wife just started playing a game upstairs and it was really loud. That was funny. I think the, the stereo was set to be too loud. Um, you probably couldn't hear it. Uh, but yeah, so th this is what Pablo was mentioning. You can do it like this. Um, I, I, I just don't get the aversion to enums. I feel like I, there's, a, there's a real aversion to enums in the, in the TypeScript world. This is fine because under the hood, that's going to recreate, it's going to create the object like we just did anyways. Um, the value of an enum being used is not in the spirit of enums, and I don't like that. Um, you mean um, this? What do you mean? Uh, but right now I want to figure out what is what is this magic number and do we add it to our config because it looks like um, channel sets 
has a number on there, but what happens if you get emotes for a different channel? Huh. Mm. I, I think I think we we can't we can't do this anymore. I think what we need to do is we need to do object dot uh, values, and then iterate over each of those. Data dot sets at data dot room. That's it. And Perselsier, thank you for the prime. A uh, long time no see. Hope your Christmas and New Year's Eve was fantastic. Yeah, I had a chill New Year's and uh, Christmas was pretty chill too. Yeah, thanks for the the resub. What Alka <laughs> data dot room dot set? Um, I'm trying to figure out where else is this set ID referenced or mentioned. Set ID is in the room object. Where is the room object? Oh, set. Cool. Let's use that. I like that. Thank you. Um. And Chad, thank you for the bits. <laughs> Did you just trigger a hype train? I appreciate that. Um, we want to grab the room as well. And then here we can say uh, room.set. Oh. Um. The room response, the room property is, uh, does not exist on the global response. That's why our type is breaking right now. Default sets, sets, users. Uh, let's just let's just create our own type. We don't have to manually create it, but let's let's call this the uh, global response, and then this is the channel response. And the channel response has sets, but it also has a room. Um, uh, and CM Griffin, thank you for the resub. Uh, Jim's lurking, wanted to get in the train. Nice, appreciate you. Yeah, shouts out to CM Griffin. I think we we rated them last time we were live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shadow room. <laughs> That's funny. I know we need we need an interface called room. Um, I think we can get this type if we look at the raw data and then try to just grab the room. I think that's it. Yeah, that should do it. Um, and then now over here, we need the, this is going to be the global response, and then this one's going to be the channel response, like that. Uh, and so now room.set is a thing. Beautiful. Yeah, the plugin is called uh, paste JSON as types. Yeah. Uh, this one. Paste JSON as code is the one. Um, how do I link to the store? Yeah, here. They have they have a website you can do it on too, but it's nice to have it like integrated. Um, okay. Awesome. We got rid of all our type errors. <laughs> and this is at least working. The thing is, um, the append function, I don't think we've 
append emote. I don't think we fixed all the types here. Yeah, so append emote um, grabs all the things we need. And then right now, sources. Um, I guess this is a record string string. I don't know if we're going to need this anymore after we update all the other codes, but... Um, Ooh. This is looking better. Okay, uh, this will be of type emote. Good to go. Now, let's work on uh, better Twitch TV. Yeah, I just use VS Code. Um, I've talked about it in the past, but um, I'm, I'm, fa I'm fast enough with uh, VS Code. I think if I was if i felt like i was slower at coding <laughs> i might try to use something like vim um but i'm i'm as fast as i want to be uh with yes code all right uh that didn't work can we not just request the data <laughs> use use vim in the new year man um you moved to Emacs. Quick Lint JS. I have not heard about it, no. What's up, user cam? Um, right now we're working on a specific library that will be used by other other projects. But this specific library is an emote parser. So over on Twitch, uh, they have this idea of emotes. I guess they have them on YouTube too, but there's a lot more over on Twitch. Um we have like these. These little images that pop up uh, and if you're on twitch you can see there's various services that if you have the extensions installed you can use their emotes too like franker faces 7 tv uh better twitch tv and um uh, one of the things is the, the the message that comes across so if you if you go to twitch right now and you don't have this extension installed you're not going to see the um the emote because those emotes need to be parsed and then rendered and then that's something that i'm doing over here too so basically it's just the tech it's just the text uh sag but my code sees oh that's an emote and then it shows the image there so that's the code that i'm working on right now is the one that looks at the code and then figures out that there needs to be an image right there um but yeah thanks for the hype train everyone appreciate you um I need to get this API response, um, and apparently when the accept type is HTML, it just redirects to the home page. Um, so I need... And Shark, turn up! What's up? Thank you for the Prime. Uh, I need to... I need to get back this JSON. Um, what's what's the, the extension everyone talks about in, in VS Code to make HTTP requests? I think I'll finally try it right now. Is it literally just called REST? 4.1 million downloads. Okay. Um, Thunder? 3.1 million downloads. I see multiple votes for Thunder. Let's just go with Thunder. I'm not going to worry about it. I could use it. It's true. I could use Axios. I mean, technically, I am using Axios. Um, all right. Now, here's my Thunder. Oh, okay. Great. New request. Please get this right now. Nice. Um, and then I can copy this response. And this, I'm going to add some new types for. So now I also want a BTTV type. And um, we're going to paste this as a type here. We're going to call this um, response, and then we're going to namespace it. Um, so we do export namespace BTTV.
Um, and then ES lint is complaint. I'm going to disable this linter rule for this sub project. Um, so that way I don't have to manually disable it. So here in my ES lint, um, for TypeScript files, we're going to disable this. Cool. Oh, um, this did this slightly wrong. I think what I want, though, is a, um, a response type. And it's just an array of emote. Like that. And thanks, Chronix. Pre appreciate you. Uh, I did judge Jlo. Yeah, we, we were just talking about that. Yeah, it's this is what it's called in the store. But if you go to quicktype.io, they you can do it on their website too. But yeah, I I paste the JSON and it turns it into a specific and turns it into TypeScript types. Uh, they also have plugins for Java and C Sharp and a bunch of other stuff too. Um, this is weird. These user IDs. Okay, um, there's an ad, so we're gonna we're gonna pause for the ad, and then we'll go use these types. Um, but yeah, the better Twitch TV response is like much nicer to work with than the um, um, what, what the Franker faces one. This like this literally just responds with an array of emotes, which is nice. Yeah, no worries, Shark Turnup. It's good to see you, too. Happy New Year. I guess we could try to do something interesting on the breaks. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just waiting for the ads to be over right now. I probably I need an I need an overlay. Um, that says there's currently an ad break. Actually, do I have this running? No. But we'll pause. Shouldn't user ID just be a string? Probably. I think uh, QuickType tried to infer that like every single one of these user IDs is like exactly the same. But um, I think I'm okay with changing that type to just be string. Yeah, I think you have a good point. Okay, <laughs> ad is over. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I like what you're saying. Yeah, let's just make that a string because the, these these are not useful to us. Like, we're never going to use those IDs anyways. So um, we'll just make it a string. Awesome. Now we have this type. Uh, first of all, let's export it here. And then we can use it in our emote parser over here. So... Um, We'll also pull in uh, BTTV, great. And then we can fix this function here. So uh, this and uh, Rubadub TV or Rubadub, <laughs> Rubadub, Rubadub TV. Welcome in. Thank you for the raid. Uh, appreciate you. Yeah, what were you working on? TypeScript Game Dev Browser 2D MMO. Nice, nice. Well, welcome in raiders. Uh, we're working in TypeScript right now. Um, and this is the coding garden. I write lots of codes and stuff. Uh, today, I am learning and figuring out NX, which is a mono repo tool. Um, but so far, I have this project going. And we have uh, 
two packages. <laughs> so basically, uh, mono repos allow you to have multiple packages and you can use them all together. But one of the things we just did, like maybe an hour ago, was we created this package called types that's going to have all of our shared TypeScript types inside of it. Um, and then we have a specific package we're working on, which is a Twitch emote parser. So we, we essentially took... Uh, and we've we've defined the types that come back from the Franker Faces API, the Better Twitch TV API. We have all of those defined in here, and now we're using those in our emote parser. Yeah, shouldn't types be considered a library? Yeah, it is. Um, I think the the name packages typically can also refer to like libraries and stuff like that too. Uh, should I show the Raiders the source folder of types? I mean, <laughs> maybe. Basically, I decided that because this library, basically, it had th this sub package has no code in it. It is only types. There's no source directory, and there's like the I guess the entry point will update to do exports, but like it's just the types. Um, mainly because I want to be able to import it like this, and then we have like these these na <laughs> these namespaces. <laughs> but yeah, welcome in Raiders. I appreciate you and. Uh, we're going to get back to, to coding. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm taking this code I wrote, honestly, like years ago at this point. This this emote parsing code has existed for like almost three or four years. Uh, right now, I'm uh, we're writing tests for it and we're adding TypeScript because it was written with just JavaScript. So we're slowly adding types to all of our functions like these get BTTV emotes. Uh, this is where this is where we're at. This should be BTTV dot response right here. Um, and then I need to make sure that uh, the response for uh, getting emotes for a specific Twitch ID, we need to make sure that that um, responds in the same way. And I think it does. Oh. New request. Go. Um, so it has an ID. Oh, no, it's different. We have channel emotes and then shared emotes. Okay, so we're, we're just going to parse this type. We're going to create some, some new types for it as well. Um, so let's copy this. And we're using this uh, extension called paste JSON as code. Um, and we're going to do that here. Um, HJSON as types, and the top level is going to be a channel response. Yeah, and then there is some there's some overlap here. Um, like image type got duplicated because it was on both of them, so we only need that to be defined once. And then um, user ID, we'll just make it a string. And then shared emote is the same as emote, I'm pretty sure. ID code, image type, animated, user ID, modifier, width, height. There's also a user property, though. Hmm. If that's the case, then I'm just going to extend the type. Um, But channel emote, yeah, and then this is this is a string. Um, channel emote is just emote, right? Um, I have to look at these side by side. <laughs> Image type, animated, user ID. Uh, we don't have modifier or width or height. Oh, but they are optional. Let's combine these types. And this can just be emote. And then shared emote is also very similar. Um, you can say user is optional. And user ID is optional but otherwise it's the same. And then these are all just emotes. Cool, that should be fine. Um, I 
Now, yeah, so uh, the, the mono repo thing we're trying right now is Inex. This is a single code base that, that has multiple packages in it. Um, okay, so this is the uh, better Twitch TV response, and then this is going to be the uh, channel response. And then it already knows, yeah, what channel emotes and shared emotes are. Um, so all emotes is a BTTV response, which is an array of emote. Um, we're just going to concat them all together. And then here is where we just want to use our enum or enum, which is um, uh, emote source dot BTTV like that. Uh, this takes in a BTTV dot emote, and then. Let's let's make sure we get the types right here. This is our selector. It's this. Um, ah, it's it's complaining because we want this to be URLs. We'll have to figure out the best way to do this. But right now, to get them to match would be like this. Um, yeah. Oh, Moon Repo. No, I haven't. I haven't heard of that. Um, yeah. Inex has the idea of lib and package directory. Oh, I didn't know that. People are saying they're the same. Here's, here's the thing, though. Um, I plan on publishing both of these to NPM. So to me, it makes sense to put them in packages. Because they're they're literally going to be published as npm packages. Um, that's my hope, anyways. Okay, now is where we figure out how do we make this match the same response as ffz. Because ffz, um, if we look at its type, has URLs, and then their URLs have sizes like one, three, and four, with the the URL as the as the bout as the the properties are sizes, the values are the URLs. So we want to construct this in a similar way. Um, I guess we could just provide all of them. Like one, two, three, and four. But I guess it only, only goes up to two. Does it go up to four? Let's test it. Um, we need our response here. All right, so we have our ID. Yeah, so they don't have 4x on Better Twitch TV, but they do have 3x and 2x and 1x. Okay. Um, here's what I want to do, though. I wanted to find a shared type called URLs that's used by all of these others now. Is it really, Alka? Well... I guess um, I don't think I'm. I'm just including what they already have. I'm not even overriding what they what they gave us. So, um. oh, I see. But yeah, we just determined there is no four x. Um, I like small, medium, large. That's a nice little API there, right? URLs dot small, URLs dot medium. Um, and then we can we can reformat this here.
Um, but now we can update the type. So instead of URLs just being key string, it can this will be uh, small, medium, large. Like that. <laughs> Alco is the model for OpenAI. Um, let me confirm I still have the... Uh, I'm still thinking about Franker faces in the right way. And is it possible that in... Yeah, so 1, 2, 4 are the URLs. I guess it could be possible that they don't have... They should have every size for every emote, right? Right? Um... We're bound to hit some edge case, though. But this seems fine. Cool. All right. Um, takes in an emote and returns void. That's not true. This returns an emote. <laughs> yeah, it's something we'll handle in the future. You'll notice how I just started coding and stopped writing tests. Uh, this is this is um, this is just how I do things sometimes. Um, let's fix this type error. Type emoticon is missing the following properties from type emote code and source. So selector takes in an, emot an emoticon and returns an emote. But it it doesn't return void. It returns uh Returns an emote. Take an emoticon, return an emote. Oh. Emote is an emoticon. I guess I can actually define the types here. So input is uh, ffz dot emoticon or uh, bttv dot emote Wait, what? Oh. I think I've reached my limit. <laughs> I've been coding and I've been I've been live for four hours. I really can't write, wrap my mind around this. Um I think first of all, I think I have the type defined wrong here. So like it's really messing me up because it's a it's a curried function. So selector is a function that takes in either a Franker faces emoticon or a Franker faces emote and 
or a bit better Toshibi emote and returns an emote. And then we have a function that takes in the emote and then appends it. Um, I think this is the only issue is this, uh, this type here needs to be used there. I'll put it in its own type. Um, um, we'll call this emote types. And these emote types can be used here or here. And that should fix this. No, it doesn't. I, yeah, I've been standing this whole time. <laughs> hey, what's up, Ryan? Uh, I, I definitely rewind the stream. If you watch over on YouTube, you can rewind the stream. But at the beginning of the stream, we talked about what is a mono repo? Why do we need one? Who uses them? What are some of your options? And then we are specifically using NPM workspaces in NX to get our mono repo going. But uh, short answer is it is a single repo that has multiple projects inside of it. In this case, we have our single repo, we have our emote parser project, and now we have a, some shared types that we can use in both of those projects. So the idea is eventually I'm gonna add in all of the things I use for my overlays and for coding garden, and then they can more easily share code uh, once they're in this repo. And I can start to publish things. So I'll, um, uh, we'll publish emote parser to NPM so that people can pull just that library in if they're trying to parse emotes for whatever they're building. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, uh, this curried function really, it's really thrown me for a loop. Okay, so selector takes in a thing, returns an emote. This already returns an Wait, wait, this is this. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. That. That? <laughs> Turn the anonymous function into a named one? I am really struggling. Okay. Um. Pinned emote with the selector returns a new function. Yeah, that takes in any one of the emote types. This would be so easy in C sharp. I mean, um, it is easy. I just messed it up. <laughs> I can't think through it. Um, Does the re return function take emote types or emote? I thought it should take emote types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're returning this function. And uh, this function needs to take in the emote types because specifically all is an array of emoticon, which is one of the emote types. Um, but... Yeah, selector takes in this, returns that. Oh, we're in an ad. Hmm. The selector function, yeah, maybe this is my issue. Maybe this is my issue. Um, I'll, I'll wait until the ad is over to, to finish. But um, because I'm specifying bttv.emote right there, it's complaining that it's not the full emote types. Um, maybe? Yeah. My, my dashboard says that 
The ad is still playing. <laughs> Ads are done. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, and what's up, Alex? No, I'm not working on a scraper. I am working on a tool that parses emotes for Twitch messages. That's what I'm working on. Um, and I think why this is complaining is right now I have a specific one instead of the whole emote types. If I do that, yeah, it stops complaining. It stops complaining there, but I don't I don't I don't want it to stop complaining. Um I guess I don't want an I want this to be like or. It could be any one of these types. What's the right way to express that? Because I think right now I'm am I combining the types? Um, but I want to say that input can be one of can be either emoticon or emote. Ooh. Hmm. Yeah, no, no worries, Alex. Uh, I mean, we're using Axios to make a request to the various APIs. Like we're calling the Better Twitch TV API and the Fraker Faces API. Yeah, that's correct. Then. Okay, so I'm curious. Maybe, maybe my. Yeah. So if this is correct, if this, if this is any one of those types, it's funny that th this stops complaining if I just change this to emote types. I think, anyways. Um. Let's let's read this type error. Also, I think I have, yeah. Emote types is not assignable to type emote. Type emoticon is missing the following properties from type emote. Well, you you're do, you you do it with a. Um, is this called a union type? It's the result of multiple types. And then this is like a type intersection, which is combining types into a single type. So yeah, that's that's how you say this can accept one of of many types. Um, and returns emote. I thought I was returning the I'm returning emote though. So code source and URLs, yeah. So it takes in a thing, returns an emote. Yeah, emote types is just um just this. It's the two different kinds of emotes. You have your Franker face emote and your bitter Twitch TV emote. Um, let me, I'm, I guess, I think I'm reading this error wrong. Yeah. Um, argument of type function that takes in an emoticon and returns an emote is not assignable to parameter of type Function that takes in emote types and returns an emote. Emote, emote types is not assignable to type emoticon. That's our issue. Yeah, we could we could say any, <laughs> but it's but the thing is it's not any. It's either BTTV emote or a Franker face emote. And I use the same type at selector function definition. Um I mean, it breaks, 
because then it doesn't know um which properties exist on it. Let me just search the web. Make sure I'm thinking about this right. So, right, uh, TypeScript function accept two different types as input. One of two types. Yeah. This. Try using type assertions. Um. Oh. I see. I think what I would have to do is call this emote types. Um, and then I, I can't do an implicit return anymore. Um, then to destructure it, I can tell it that it is a BTDB emote because I'm, I think that's kind of what I have to do. Um, or I guess I could just do it in line. And then here we could do emote as BTTV dot emote dot vote. This, this is how I would have to do it. And then I can do the same thing here. Am I okay with this though? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but here we just have emote is emote types, and then code is emote as, um, ffc emoticon dot name. Um, in this case, I'm already here, so I could say, uh, ffz emote is this. And then I can do this. I guess that's fine. I think if I if I want this reusable curried function, I, I kind of have to be more explicit. Um, cast the selector itself to the correct type. Well, the issue is this one up here is very generic. Couldn't the responses be standardized so you don't have to duplicate this logic? Um, that's kind of what we're trying to do. I mean, <laughs> basically, the other option is, um, yeah, don't use a curried function. So uh, append emote literally just accepts a um, um, an emote. This is the this is honestly this is the better way to do it. Let's just do it this way. Um we'll just do it this way. Then we don't have a curried function and then it's it's like way it's 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 simpler to look at too. Um Um Like that. This, 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 this is better. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, seven is me or seven ij me. Um, some people, some people do like to co work or like leave me on in the background while they're working. Um, but yeah, this this is better. <laughs> I was trying to do the weird currying thing, but literally we are we are already reformatting it into a standardized format, 
and then just passing that to a pinned emote. So th this this is better. Um, because at this point I can I can make this an uh, implicit return as well. Um, Yeah, I think the the curried function was fun to pretend like I am a, a an advanced programmer, <laughs> I guess. Um, but is it's better without it. Cool. Ah, there. And then now this gives us each emote. And then, then we pass it in like that. Done. Done, 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 done. <laughs> How am I going to write unit tests with all these hard-coded URLs? Um, I would I would create a um, a mock, but you're completely right. We, sh we should extract these into like a config object. Um, you make a great point. Um, instead of having these URLs like in our code here, we should literally have just another file that specifies the URLs. Um, and then the code's easier to change in the future too. One, one of the breaking changes we ran into recently was 7TV changed their API URL entirely. Um, so having a single spot with all the URLs I think is, would be useful. And, um, well, yeah, well, did it, did it have some squigglies? Get BTTV emos? Why is this one? What's that squiggly about? Oh, unknown word. Um, all right. I think I have to go. We're, we're going to keep working on this. Ba basically, maintenance Monday is we, we keep working on this stuff. We might even we might even work on it like on a Tuesday or a Thursday if I have nothing else going on, too. Uh, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and I'm very happy with the progress that we made today. Yeah. Happy New Year, uh, Joshua. Appreciate you. And Happy New Year to everyone else that's hanging out, too. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we, we at least started here with our, we got NX working. Um, the project generation is really nice. We have some shared types, which is really cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with all of this. I'm very happy with it. Um, the next time we work on it, we will um, just basically keep working on the emote parser. Like, Keep refactoring everything. Start writing tests. <laughs> it's we stopped writing tests like two two three hours ago. Um, we need a. There's a typo in Fraker faces. Let's see. Um, where did my code go? Oh no, this is, this is fine. Yeah. I love streams like this, refactoring, refactoring and iterating on existing code. I think it's pretty fun too. The, I mean, the, the main issue, like the, I guess the uh, criticism of all of this is like, well, are you actually getting anything done? Cause you're just, you're just, you're just reforming code that already works. Um, I think ultimately we're just making this code like way more maintainable. Um, and reusable. That's, that's the, honestly, that's the main issue with most of the stuff that I've created for stream in terms of like overlays and everything else. It's not very reusable. Um, and that's one of the main goals of this is make it so that other people can benefit from this code because other people want to parse emotes all the time. Like if they're writing a custom overlay or whatever else. Um, and so if this were in a nice reusable, maintained, tested format, that's 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 the goal. Um, okay, <laughs> I absolutely hate refactoring. When I have to refactor, I uh, you really have to force me to do it. Hey, what's up, Murdoch? Welcome in. Um, and refactor, thank you for the tier one. Happy New Year. Keep refactoring. Nice, nice. <laughs> that's that's very very relevant. Right when we're talking about refactoring, my life is an endless cycle of refactoring, and I'm happy with that. I mean, honestly, that's a lot of professional software development is is like refactoring and reworking. Um, but ultimately, refactoring with tests is really what you need because then you can refactor with confidence, right? 
um, to do. Start here. <laughs> we, we, we abandoned our tests uh, and we wrote way too much code without it. Okay. I, I'm not going to push this code up to GitHub just yet because um, I, I want like passing tests in a working code base before I have like even an initial commit. I probably should have done an, an initial commit. Um, actually, did NX do that for us? Yeah, NX technically has an initial commit of of the generated project, but regardless, we've 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 made way too many changes. Uh, remove the ESLint comment now. Didn't I do that? I thought I did that. We've got FFC. Yeah. See you later, uh, Seven I Jamie. Um, I, I guess I don't know what you preferred to be called, but thank you for hanging out. Appreciate you. Happy New Year. I can chase a bug for days without blinking, but making me refactor a single component and I will hate every second of it. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, we're going to keep working on this at least next Monday, but we might work on it on Thursday as well. Um, in the other project? Here? Oh. Nice. <laughs> right there. Early on, we said uh, any type, but now we fixed it. Um, my schedule is not updated, but I'm going to try to get it updated tonight. Um, I hope to go live on Wednesday and we're going to call it web security Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we're going to do some hacking, uh, which will be pretty fun. I think I'll at least try to do like a one, one try hack me. Um, yeah, I think this is the one where they like spin up a container and then you can try to hack into it. Um, if not, we'll find it because there's also like uh, hack the box and some other ones. But I, I think try hack me is the is like the easier easier one to get going. So we'll do this, and then also we'll check out um, uh, juice box. I think it's called juice box. Oh, uh, juice shop. <laughs> oh, watch juice shop. So juice shop is a Node.js code base that purposefully has vulner vulnerabilities in it. Um, but you can clone the code base down and then uh, fix the vulnerabilities to learn about web security. So on Wednesday, this is what we're going to be doing. So, uh, this, like I said, the uh, this schedule isn't updated, but I but I hope to be live on Wednesday to work on that. Um, Pico CTF. That's like a tiny capture of the flag. Yeah, there's a um, honestly, um, cybersecurity has been just like a, a hobby of mine. I haven't talked about it a lot on stream because we mostly talk about like web uh, web development and building apps. Um, but we might even just do an introduction to cybersecurity because terms like CTF um, and like flags and different stuff like that, a lot of people don't even know those terms because they're not familiar with the security stuffs. Um, a two-week competitive CTF open to anyone. That's a really, first of all, that's a really bad UI pattern. Where like I'm reading and then it just moves. Um, with prizes available to eligible teams, registration opens soon. Pico Primer? Oh, this looks awesome. This is like a, like an intro to, intro to hacking and stuff like that. Cool. But yeah, that's the plan for Wednesday. And then Friday, we're going to do another Try Day Friday where I try something brand new. Um, it's probably either going to be like .NET or Rust because that was uh, near the top of the list of suggested things last time. Um, but that's the plan for this week. Thanks, everyone, for, for hanging out. We got a ton of support today. Thank you for all the, the resubs and the bits. Thanks again to uh, Brick Zerker for the raid and uh, rub -a -dub TV for the raid. Um, you all are awesome. I appreciate you. And uh, we'll, we'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, stick around for the raid. So... If you are a sub, you can use this raid message. Um, if you are not a sub, you can use this raid message. And um, if you're watching over on YouTube, uh, head over to Twitch. Head over to my channel. Um, and as long as you're just on, on my channel, you'll go along with us to the raid wherever, wherever we raid next. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's all. I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this.